rule in grip sport is you tell everyone about grip sport. You know, crushing, pinch grip, thick bar, wrists. If the best guy in the world can't lift 100 pounds on it, I, I don't give a shit about it. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Grip Show. So I am sitting here with Chaz Strange from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, yep. part of Team PA or Team Pennsylvania, <laughs> as we like to joke. Um, but yeah, um, if you're familiar with The Grip Board at all, you might know him as Stranger. If you've been on Instagram or anything, you might have seen the logo Stranger Grip. Um but yeah, so he's he's been on a lot of these different platforms, been involved in around grip sport, um, steel bending, grippers, all all, all kinds of stuff. Um, so we're definitely going to dive in and uh, pretty much just discuss his background and how he started to uh, find out about all this stuff and what he's up to now. So uh, welcome to the show, Chaz. Well, thanks for having me. So yeah, man. first first episode was great with Joe. I really I really well done. So excited yeah, Joe, for this. Joe's going and trying to set the bar high on us. So now hopefully we don't mess this up, but uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> now nah, it should be good. Um, so it, it might sound like kind of a, a cliche question. How'd you find out about grip? But uh, I, I want to bring it up to you, especially because you were in a place where you found out about this stuff. Like when you were in high school, it was very early on. Like we're talking yeah. I don't want to say like the dark ages of grip, but you know what I mean? You, you have some old school names that like, when you first tuned into this, like who were the guys you were looking at and like on grip board or whatever it may be, who were the, who were the names that were popular back then? And uh, like, how did you discover it? And just give, give us a rundown of that. So we, me and my buddies got in the grip. Uh, Wayne, he's on the grip board is Wayne. Uh, Mike, he's goof on the grip board. And then my buddy Kev, who was mind over matter, and then he got a new one, K Payone or whatever. And so we all got into it. It was like 2005, and they went to like a martial artist store to buy like a suitcase pad, which we're not we're not fighters or anything. We're just like we want to try to kick, <laughs> like, you know, even background. So whatever, we were in high school. So they go and they come back and they bring back this hand gripper, and it's like a, it looks like a cap and a crush, but it's not. It's like some like off off brand thing. And they bring it back to my buddy's Mike's house, and like we can't close it. And we're like, "Why is this thing so hard?" Like, yeah. it, we we've seen these plastic handle ones before. Like, we never, you know. Like I said, we were. I was a, I guess I was a junior in high school. Mike was like a senior. Wayne was like a year or two out. And we can play. So so we did some digging, found the grip board, uh, and then found out about Captain's a Crush. Bought like a one, a two, and a three. Couldn't close the two the first time. And then that escalated into, we all got on the grip board. It was like 2005. So there weren't any half grippers, no 1.5s or 2.5s or 3.5s. There wasn't a guide or a sport. It was the trainer to the four. So we got on there and we'd see guys like, like Dave Morton was smashing big grippers. Uh, Shane Larson, he was closing big grippers. Uh, Pat Povilitis was bending crazy things to steal. Gaza, Gary Hunt, the legend from uh, England or whatever. Lots of controversy behind him and his bends and whether or not they're... Mm -hmm. he's. If you look up Gaza on the grip board, it goes Gaza, blah, 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 banned. <laughs> like you got kicked. <laughs> there's yeah. a whole bunch of like, there's two different like group. Now everyone thinks he's legit based off of, uh, you know, some bends that happened from uh, like, uh, there's a Derek Grayball. Like he's, his bending kind of like solidifies Gaza more it was so outlandish what he was doing yeah. and now like then derek's doing it at like sub 200 pounds it's like all right maybe this guy isn't a full of shit liar or whatever yeah, yeah. so so we got we got into it 2005 and it was, it was just grippers every day it was grippers we just wanted to close literally hanging out in the summertime trying to close grippers every day because we didn't know what we were doing and then that then we found out about steel bending we we're like all right so we walked to home depot which was five miles away in a terrible neighborhood in philly you know like it was just like <laughs> god awful like found some found some uh, bolts and nails and some sticks of rod started bending those i i ordered like the iron mine bag of nails it comes with all of their nails and then like one red this is before the gold nail came out so I, we we got that and then 
we were all bending double underhand. And I was I was the best out of us, our group, I was the best one. I got it down, a blue nail down to like a four and a half inch piece or something, something really small. You know, blue nail six inches by quarter round cold rolled steel. I got it down like four and a half inches. Then they all figured out how the double overhand, how the Hall brothers figured out the folding technique, they would call it. And they were all bending reds and bastards and stuff, you know, five sixteenth stock. And I was still just stuck at quarter inch and just got left behind by them. Like uh, Wayne and Mike are actually number 33 and 34 on the bastard list, which is like 160 people. And they don't even do that sir, anymore. But okay. so that's how like far back we're going. Uh, so, yeah, we got, you know, grippers were huge for us and then steel bending. And then we were like, we've seen people ripping decks of cards and phone books. And it's like, you see that stuff as like a little kid. You're like, oh, it's, that's crazy. That's impossible. And then you're on the grip board and God's like, oh, I just did a deck and a half deck. And you're like, oh, oh, I don't know who you are. And you just did this, but like these guys are doing it on TV. And it's insane. like, is this just possible? So we go to the dollar store, buy decks of cards, you know, learn how to rip those, get the John Brookfield DVD, uh, blueprint for functional hand strength, get all the Dennis Rogers DVDs, you know, 336 pounds of fury, crazy but powerful, uh, how to drive a nail pen, how to go all this crazy shit. And then, um, and phone books, this is, I don't know if I told you this or not. So in 2005, 2006, you could just order phone books to your house. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. For free. So I ordered 100. <laughs> <laughs> I come home, so I come home from school. So I call the lady up. I'm like, hey, uh, I, want, I need some phone books. I need 100 phone books. She's like, all right, uh, what's the name of your business? I was like, it's a house. <laughs> She's like, like 10 seconds of dead air. She's just like, all right, what's your address? Yeah. I come home from school like a week later and it's a row home in Philly. It's not a big lawn. It's like a, a 10 by 12 piece of grass. You could call lawns, the front of our house. Yeah. And it was just covered in boxes from UPS. My mom <laughs> yeah, was, like, it was like palletized or something. Like they were, they were just big, like, what, like 18 by like 20 some like boxes. But there was like seven of them because I got a hundred of them. Yeah, and my mom was like, "What the fuck is this?" I was like, "Oh, the phone books. We're gonna rip them in half." Yeah, that makes sense, right? You can only imagine, like, you know, your parents, like, at that time, like, <laughs> what, is, what is all this shit doing out here in the yard? Oh, they're phone yeah. books. Okay, you got a hundred phone books, and it's like, yeah, yeah why? <laughs> oh, well, we're gonna tear them in half. Like, what to most people, people, yeah, makes it no just, sense. It, gets, it makes yeah, it gets more nonsensical as you go. So I got pretty good at writing phone books in half, which is cool. You know, the Philly phone book at that time was probably two, two and a half inches thick. Okay. I was ripping them, you know, pretty, pretty steady regularly. But now it's just you can't find them anymore. Is what yeah. sucks. It's just, that's one. I've been meaning to call uh, Yellow Pages try to get some, but but anyway. So we got into rippers, steel bending, then the old time feats of strength, and that was like really our thing. And then that kind of like that went on for like two years. Then we started going to the gym and this little, you know, rundown gym in our neighborhood, old school, you know, it's called Nirvana Family Fitness. Uh, it would like when it rained outside, it would rain inside. There's ivy growing inside the wall, like real old, dirty, okay. like Nautilus, yeah. there's chain link machines and everything like that. Yeah. Old, you know, everything's old York plates. And then there's like the Biller deep dish plates and stuff. So we did some you know, plate hubbins and plate pinching there. And that was, you know, it was cool to have access to that. You just think it's like everywhere. And nowadays you're like, oh, you can't find that. <laughs> like, it's, yeah, you know. because uh, you you showed me a video. Um, it, it's probably been a little while now, but um, you were doing like uh, hub lifting, uh, like a 45 yeah. pound plate by the hub, but you were doing like hub curls, hub clean. It's like, a, it's like uh, you, you're doing that stuff. But I mean, you're only a few years older than I am, but... Mm -hmm. This video was like, I, I forget what year. I don't want to say that the wrong video year. was 2011. So we got in the grip in 2005, yeah. did it for a couple of years, kind of fell off a little bit, came back in like 2010, did it for a couple of years, fell back off. And then I've been back with it since 2020 now. Okay. But that video was when we came back to grip. And I, you know, I remember not even like, like we, me and Wayne are at the gym and me and him were just going to the gym, you know, four days a week for, years and years and years and then he was like yo uh, why don't you uh i was like you know i was always, i was pretty good at helping the plates and he's like why don't you try curling them we'll get them on video i'm like, i'm not thinking anything of them. i was like all right and that's that one video of me curling yeah. them and then adding 
I tried the rim to hub transfer, did that. I think what my one hand, I'll just try something, get it or not get it, and then move on. Because I wasn't really too, I wasn't, I was on the grip board. I didn't really care too much about grip, but I was having like fun with it at the gym. You know, wish I would have pursued it more and stayed with it, but yeah, that's how that was. That and then we did get grippers back again. Then you know, that's when. And then we were like, oh, they made a two point five. This is great because now you have something. You know, instead of having to buy a Supermaster, which back then you could just get for twenty five bucks at Weightlifter Warehouse, instead of like the two hundred dollars they are now. It's like, oh, I could get a Captain the Crush version of this. You know, that's that's cool. So, yeah, that's uh. That's kind of how we got into it. Found out about, you know, you know, like I said, Dave Morton, Shane Larson, Larson, uh, Pat Povolitis. Obviously, Jed was on there too. We we met up with him one time when uh uh Slim the Hammer Man, his hammers were getting put into the York Hall of Fame up in okay. York Barbell. Yeah, yeah. So they had like a big thing for that. And then Wayne was like, Hey, we'll, we'll let's go up. We're gonna we'll bring my inch dumbbell. Uh we'll meet up with Jed up there. He wants to you know, see two inch dumbbells because back then it was kind of hard to, they're really hard to come up, but they still are, but yeah, you know, but, but they're uh, a lot more rare back then. I mean, or yeah. it would have been, it would have been a tougher thing to, I don't know, just not as accessible. Yeah. And so with like social media today, you can talk to people like now you know a bunch of people that have them, but back then it wasn't as you're on the grip board, you're locked, there's no mobile app for it in 2011. You're just on a website yeah. on your computer versus yeah. now you have like access to everything you can see. So, so we ended up bringing up wings inch dumbbell up there and we you know we meet meet jed whatever say what's up to him and uh andrew darney out there okay so we got the two inch dumbbells they're laying there whatever we're all just you know we're bullshitting whatever andrew darney comes up looks at them he's like oh all right sets them up a little bit gets down picks them up and just runs and he goes <laughs> like he goes like i don't know whatever the world record is plus 10 feet Jed's freaking out. He's like, did anyone record that? Did anyone? Like, no, it was just a spur of the moment thing he did. And it was just like a solid, yeah. like, this is 2010, 2011, like 30, maybe 40 feet double inch run. Like, yeah, no warm up, just look, but just oh, on, okay. on the fly. Like, just yeah. walked up, just did it, like, no plan. Just, oh, there they are. And just yeah. ran with it. Yeah. yeah. It was, it was super, super cool to see. So, yeah. And that's, you know, that's pretty much how, you know, how we got started in grip, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And then for the most part, you kind of, uh, I'll use the word specialized. I don't want to limit you to one thing, mm -hmm. but you definitely kind of, uh, I think when we first met or first started talking a little bit through the grip board, even, I think that's how we, uh, grip board or online somewhere is kind yeah. of where, where we started seeing posts of each other or seeing lifting, whatever. But, um, I noticed you were bending a lot of steel and a lot of grippers. So you were yeah. still very heavy grippers, heavy steel. And like you said, it wasn't until maybe your uh, like 2020-ish comeback to grip mm -hmm. where I feel like you started to kind of dive into, you know, more aspects of grip, like the thick bar, the pinch, and kind of hitting some of these other, I guess, contest implements or feats of strength. Yeah. Is that pretty accurate? Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't, I never even thought about competing uh, like ever. I was just like, oh, it's do certifications, you know, you did match monitor, mm -hmm. Captain Crush, whatever, Red Nail Sir, Faster Sir, whatever. And I never even like thought or like cared to compete until uh, Josh Culpepper messaged me. Okay. And he's like, yo, man, you going to nationals? I was like, I'm not going to net. No, I'm not going to nationals. He's like, you should go, man. You're, you know, you're pretty, pretty strong. You should qualify and go. And you're in, you're in Philly. It's not far for you if it's in uh, Harrisburg. And I'm like, yeah, maybe I will try to go. So I'm like, I've never competed. Like, I'm like, you know, we, we start and you and I started talking. Uh, and I think I remembered the message. You remember? I'm not 100% sure. I, I'll, I probably I, will when you say it. I think it was, hey, man, where'd you get that 143 inch dumbbell? The God's a grip one you got? Yeah. And then you had to message me separately. You're like, dude, I don't want to talk about how much I paid for this because of the shipping. Yeah. No, it was it was an interesting thing. I think that might be the only one they've uh, shipped to the States. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so a lot was, of people have asked me about that 143 pound inch bell um, uh, and, and you can get them from Nathan Hall or, you know, Nathan's doing that thing from your, the UK or whatever. But at the time it's like, I don't know. I see a dumbbell online. It's in stock. They're saying they do shipping quotes. I'm like, fuck it. Like <laughs> send me, can I order this online? Is it going to show up at my house? Like, what do we got to do? And uh, 
they, they were pretty cool about it but yeah that's that's when i uh <laughs> I, I got that because like i said getting an inch dumbbell is hard enough and then when you want to get yeah. like baby inches or inch bells at lighter weights or whatever or heavier weights even it it gets a little trickier um but uh but yeah so you basically were saying that you were uh kind of getting ready for your first um uh, time yeah. nationals and stuff so so for nationals leading up to it i my hand was kind of hurt i couldn't uh i wasn't closing grippers i was doing some other stuff and then I think it, it was the Monday before Monday or Tuesday before nationals. And my hands started feeling better. And I was like, I was looking at the qualification things. And I was like, all right, there's three things I can do. I can pub a 45 pound plate. I can close a 155 plus gripper for my, you know, this is all for my weight class gripper. I was like, and I can, I was like, I haven't done this in a while, but back when we first got into it, like I was saying all those years ago, when we were, I think probably maybe 2006 or maybe 2011, 10, we were yeah. levering sledgehammers and I could do a 16 pound back then. Okay. And I was like, if I do that now, that qualifies me now. So I ran the lows. I, I think I closed the gripper, got it on, on film. And I was like, all right, let me go buy a sledgehammer real quick. Ran out, yeah. bought a sledgehammer, had to film it outside to get the whole angle and everything like that. So I did the sledge, the hub and the gripper made that video, sent it to Joe. I was like, hey, this is qualified me for nationals uh, in five days. And he's like, he's like, yeah, man, that's, that's, that's good. Yeah. And uh, went from, I did nationals that Saturday, and I think I did the Super Series the following Saturday. It was the first, that was my first, you know, two competitions. Okay, so you, but you pretty much had like this uh, almost a decade plus exposure to the like ogs of grippers steel bending feats yeah. you know you're talking about all this <laughs> stuff but yet you still hadn't competed so you pretty much had like a decade plus exposure to it and then you just like on a whim or with a little persuasion you're pretty much just like okay i'm gonna do a competition and then since then you've been very active and you pretty much just dove head in like dove head yeah. first right i mean yeah. you're talking about like nationals uh super series um what other competitions have you done that that first year it was nationals super series stage one stage two skillet hands king kong and then napalm uh nightmare world championship and then yes yeah, so it was between june and the end of the year was six like basically one a month yeah so you so were I just i mean you were just them rattling out. them off yeah but and, yeah. and it's because like so at nationals, first time ever, like going out and meeting other people for well, I met like an old time strongman back when back in the day when I was in high school. That's actually, that's a kind of funny story. Uh, but like first time like going somewhere and like meeting people for like grip, and like the competition was great. Like everyone's have everyone's super friendly, everyone's having a good time. Like everyone's like helping each other out. And then after the contest was so much fun like we're, we're just hanging out like we're just hanging out we're bullshitting we're doing little feats and stuff like that uh, i think i ripped some cards i i bent something i lift up i think tim butler had a good 135 bell there yeah uh, you did you did that glob right the 70 75 70 uh 75 75 tim, yeah, tim, tim butler had a half 75 glob yeah. which is like a it's like a blob blobs are cut from the original york roundhead dumbbells that's yeah. the typical blob that you see or that's the original uh feet but then you have the older version of york dumbbells which are globe shaped total like they yeah. look like cannonballs basically but right, then right. people will call them globs so mm -hmm. um a half 75 glob um and at that time tim butler told me that only him and nate browse had picked that one up and then right. I, I picked it up that day. I, I don't, I'm sure there's maybe a couple other guys around that could have tried, you know, no one else, you know, there, I mean, people were just, some were trying, some were not, but uh, I picked that up. So I was pretty cool with that lift. Um, but yeah, we were just all screwing around trying to lift anvils and yeah. inch oh, yeah, bells anvil. <laughs> and, 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 and stuff like that. I actually, uh, because uh, Clint Ziegler did the, like the Jowett style, like where he like swung the anvil by the horn flipped it caught it on the face type thing like he had done that yeah. before and he brought the same like 95 pound anvil he had mm -hmm. and uh we're just in a i mean a crowd of like people are just like circling around and i remember like well shit he brought that 95 pound anvil let me just try to do that 
And like the first time I went to swing it, it like flew two feet, like forward <laughs> out of my hand. And Clint was like, dude, like maybe like don't swing it towards people. And I wasn't even like thinking that like, yeah, like I might fucking smack someone with a 95 pound anvil if it leaves my hands. You know, when you go to swing it and try to clean it, I'm like, yeah. So I, I almost like probably, you know, I, mean, I didn't I almost hit somebody, but like, I wasn't even aware of it until he was kind of like, Hey dude, like, uh, yeah. Like when you go to clean that thing, like whatever, don't, don't, don't aim it towards like these random couples that are walking by and have no idea. Right. What's at. But, uh, <laughs> but no, yeah, that, yeah, that, no, I remember that. That was a lot of fun. Like I said, a lot of feats going right. on and, uh, you brought me some steel. I'm not a big steel yeah. bender. Um, I'm very new to it, but you, kind of you know introduced me and just kind of brought some extra steel that you had and uh stuff like that so i was i was thankful for that and uh you know everybody had a good time so uh that's, that's the best part about competing is the after feats like every every single time i go to a contest the amount of fun i have with the contest depends on how much fun what we do after like nationals were great uh what else is like King Kong's, uh, oh, Skillet Hands, because we were up at Alex's house. So it was like me, Tim Butler, Alex, uh, and then a couple other people. There. Poncho was there. Okay. Uh, and that was just, that was a blast afterwards. Uh, well, wow. that's just Napalm Nightmare World Championship, like all that. Nationals this year, everything was just, you know, that makes, oh, and the Maryland Strongest Hands. That was a fun okay. after. Yeah, we had a lot of fun with that. Uh, so, yeah, it just sucks. You, you know, you put all this effort, and like these contests aren't close usually, depending on where you're at. You drive, you know, anywhere from one to four or five hours to get somewhere, and then go there, compete real quick, and then leave. And it's like, ah, eh, it's kind of like go there, compete, bullshit with your friends who you, you know, you don't get to see in real life, and do some grip feats with them, and you know, have fun. Yeah. So, is there anybody that uh, this is just a, this is a random question off the top of my head? So, completely unplanned, just because what we're talking about. But uh, so, noting that like a lot of times when we are um, like whether it be on like a forum like the grip board, whether it's social media, um, in this small kind of arm lifting grip sport world, um, there's a lot of people that you know everybody's spread out. Like a lot of people that are interested in it are all spread out. You know, we have some that are maybe close to us, but mm. it's spread out for the most part and you're messaging these people so a lot of times you're having conversations with people you've never met mm -hmm. like <laughs> has there ever been a time where um i don't know you talk to somebody online and then they like threw you off in person when you met them or like it was like weird you get what i'm saying like has there ever been a time where like man i've been talking to that person for like six months and then like you, you like meet them in person and you're like that was different than i expected or <laughs> you kind of get what I'm saying, and like, if, if you don't have an example, that's fine. But not that, not that I could say. Um, let me think. Uh, well, you were taller than I thought you were going to be. <laughs> oh man, what the camera had me looking short. <laughs> well, and then it's funny. Well, Jed said that to me when I walked up to him at nationals. I was like, "Hey, how's it going?" Uh, Chad Strange, we're here for nationals. And he's like, "Whoa, you're a lot bigger than you look." Right? Because I I scaled down my camera, and I'm in like a like right now, I'm pretty much touching both walls of my garage. Like okay. it's not a big space, so I gotta, yeah. you know, make do. But so it's funny. Like when I met Alex, he said the same thing. So you're a lot bigger than I than I thought. And I was like, yeah, man, I'm so, you know, gotta scale it down, and make it fit stuff in the video. Well, yeah, I say how about how tall and what what's your body weight at now, roughly? I mean, like six um, three two. Uh, I mean, I, I don't. I'm just guessing. Yeah, six three. I'm like two fifty five. Okay, yeah. So like six yeah. three two fifty five is not a yeah. not a small dude, but sometimes on camera it's hard to judge yeah. how big someone is until they like walk up and you're kind of like oh like <laughs> sometimes you're like man that dude don't look that big and then other times you're just like holy shit he's way bigger than i thought you know what i mean so yeah, yeah it definitely is a little different um talking to people online or watching them in videos and then you get in person and kind of see them and and stuff but i think that is what uh one of the cooler parts about competing is that we spend so much time kind of being spread out and discussing numbers, talking training that, you know, when you get everybody in the same room, I just think that it makes the competition better. It makes yeah. the experience better. And I think everybody has a lot more fun doing it. Um, yeah, definitely. So that first nationals that you did, that was your first like official competition. Yep. And then yeah. you think that the atmosphere of kind of meeting everybody is what kind of hooked you to continue and push at that pace to continue and like do multiple comps. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you, you go there, you know, I, uh, 
I've only ever, so what were the, what was it? It was 20 millimeter grippers, two inch napalm nightmare, three by four Saxon and little bighorn. Mm -hmm. So I've only done grippers and little bighorn before. So I was like completely new on the yeah. other two. And I was like, I was like, I don't know how I'm going to fare with it because it was four attempts. It wasn't rising bar either. So I got to like kind of pick my numbers as, I'm, as we're going, but like go there. I felt like I hit pretty good numbers on, on the stuff that I did. And then every, on top of that, everyone was like really cool. And then people are doing feats and everyone's like checking out this thing, do this. And it's just like, this is a really good, I want, I want more of this, you know? Well, and uh, everybody, uh, kind of starts to like beyond the competition it was almost like not everybody but there was almost like we couldn't wait for that nationals to kind of like hey we need this little bighorn thing to wrap up or as soon as i'm done with little bighorn we're going over here to do the feats like people were almost more excited a group of people were almost more excited yeah. to go over and do that and uh just for what it's worth um i'll give one funny story from that particular nationals Mm -hmm. um you probably you, you might remember this you might have been bending steel or tearing cards somewhere else i don't know but um this is like i said you, you guys got to remember when you're listening um all the people that i'm going to mention have gotten much stronger since two years ago <laughs> but is this is this uh jason dingy it involves jason dingy and the legacy the 120 yes, 125 yeah this and is a legacy great. blob <laughs> i remember um, this <laughs> so um Tim Butler has a half 125 legacy blob. He's since like, since then he's lifted Blobzilla. Um, he just posted a video today of him just dominating Blobzilla. Um, he's broke his napalm blob, uh, 135 legacy off the ground. So Tim, Tim's killing blobs. He's elevated much beyond that. Um, I know Luke Raymond has lifted Blobzilla before. So you know, those guys, those guys are stronger than the blob we're talking here, but so we've just done a full competition. People are a little burnout and, Tim Butler has a half 125 legacy, which is no joke. It's a big blob. And uh, me, Tim Butler, and Luke Raymond are just like kind of rotating in on it. And we're all breaking it <laughs> off the ground, but it's not really like looking very like hopeful. We're going to lock out a good lift. And then out of nowhere, just kind of <laughs> like Jason Dingy comes like shuffling over to us. And he just leans over, picks it up, holds it just kind of looks at Tim, sets it down. And he's like, what's the big deal, Tim? And then he just walked <laughs> off. Like, and then he just walked off, but it was like child's play to him. And I was just like, I just, I was, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I was like, was laughing out loud, literally, but I was cracking up like inside. I was like, damn, like, that's just fucking hilarious. Like, um, that was, yeah. So, and, he, and that was after he won nationals. He yeah. Won so, so, it's so, like, yeah <laughs> so not only did not, not only did Jason, on top. yeah, Jason just won nationals. Now he just comes over to us, poor group of three, trying to lift this blob that we can't. And uh, <laughs> he makes it look like it's a warm up. And this is post comp after he's, you know, pulled probably, I don't know how many top five lifts or maybe even close to world records at a couple events. You know what I mean? He, he yeah. He's at the top. I mean, if you're winning nationals overall, your, your lifts are going to have to be up there. So uh, he, he put in a real good performance and then comes over and basically just, uh, kind of trolls us a little bit and messes with us. And I, I just thought it was a funny story. So that one stuck with me if you're talking about the the post-comp feats, because that was also my first nationals. It wasn't my okay. first competition, but that was my first nationals. So um, my first time meeting a lot of the same people as well. Yeah. And I felt kind of the same thing you did, that <laughs> that sense of kind of community and kind of doing the feats and it being fun. And the only thing was, I think, going from, uh, what was it, Harrisburg, back down to where I'm at it was, it was a decent drive. So I wasn't yeah. staying the night and I pretty much was like, Hey, I'd love to hang out and do feats all night, but I'm heading back home. And I got like eight hour, seven, eight hour drive. You know what I mean? So yeah. uh, I, I, I dipped out a little bit and I think you guys continued to, uh, to do some feats and everything, but, uh, but yeah, no, that, like I said, it's, I think it's good that like, since you've bounced back into grip that you just hit the ground running because a lot of guys try to wait until, they uh i don't know perfect scenario they wait till all their numbers are good wait till everything's yeah. perfect and you're just like i'm doing this comp next month <laughs> i'm doing that comp and it's like you're just you're gathering so much experience on the fly yeah that like yeah so what if i mess up this competition next month I'm, I'm you know what i mean you're just getting so much experience and the guy that kind of waits for that moment to always be right and 
you're probably just hurting yourself. If you if you wait until you're ready, you'll never compete. Pretty much. Yeah, you, you have to. It's you know you're not perfect. You're not going to win them all. Like go out there, compete, have fun, meet meet people, get out of your comfort zone, stop lifting by yourself in your fucking garage, your basement, or whatever. Like get seriously, get it. Like you know, it's fine if you don't want to. Whatever you know, there's a lot of travel involved. You know, there's money, there's costs, whatever. It's not free. Yeah. There's no there's no prize money. Uh, and you know, it's fine at teach their own, but if you're in your garage or base, whatever home gym, and you're lifting and you're saying, Oh, it's this much above the world record, and you never fucking compete, then shut the fuck up about the world record. <laughs> right? Yeah, pretty, like pretty much. No I agree. Like, dude, you have the world record in your garage. Congratulations. No one fucking cares. Do it yeah. where it matters. Yeah. No, and that's exactly. all oh, that's what I want to touch on with uh, you and Joe's podcast about the exactly that. The gym lift, how much does a gym lift matter? Yeah, versus a cop lift, and it's like it doesn't. Like yeah. an, an inch dumbbell lift matters, feats matter, right? They Feats, all matter. Yeah. But, if, but if you're doing, uh, you know, a one rep max on a content implement to the height in your garage, okay, yeah, it's, it doesn't, it's training. It, it's training. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't. No one cares. Oh, I, I got fifty pounds more than this in my garage. That's cool. Yeah. That doesn't. You have the record record because, there. <laughs> because essentially that kind of just tells us what you're capable of doing in a competition. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean that you did it in competition. Like right. I'll, I'll use a fight reference. Like I said, I, I, I relate a lot of things to fighting sometimes. Like if you just took the entire population of the world and how many billions of people there are, there's a lot of them I can beat the shit out of. <laughs> yeah. But I don't get to just claim that as my record. <laughs> you know what i mean just just because i can't just because i can i like that analogy you know yeah. what i'm saying like oh i'm 300 million and whatever no you have to go and actually do it and win to actually you know get the credit like you don't just get right. to like add things to your record because you could or you you have the ability and you're able to so just because you're able to lift that it still doesn't count until it's in a competition or like you said. So basically it's, right. it's a great training day. Hats off yeah. to you. You're strong as hell. It's a good training day, but it doesn't need to be used or leveraged in a way that discredits the guy that really actually yeah. did it in competition. That's yeah. where, and, you know what I mean? And, I'm, and I'm, I really want that to be the point of that to be not people who compete and pull up all the world record. And that's not about that. It's about people who don't compete. And mention the world record, especially like someone who like doesn't compete at all, and then does a contest list and says, "Oh, that's two pounds over the world record." It's like you don't compete. I don't care. Yeah. But it's it's also then it also scales. If someone does compete and they just have none, you know, they'll get their event. But at least they're competing. They're putting, you know, yeah, you know, quote unquote, you know, quote unquote, putting their dick out there and fucking seeing what they can do versus yeah, just hiding in the garage where they, you can't you can't lose if you never compete. Right. Yeah, true. Right. You'd always <laughs> be undefeated, hanging out in the bleachers or something. Um, but yeah, and I think that's the biggest thing is if if someone is pulling a world record but they're quiet about it, then others that's are going to take th 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 others are going to mm. take notice. People are going to recognize that. But yeah. if you're the one that's vocalizing it and talking big shit about mm -hmm. it, yeah. that's when it kind of becomes like, hey, th 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 then people kind of like start to take notice in a negative way, like right. you said. You know what I mean? So yeah, uh, there might be a guy that's just pulling world records and doing phenomenal stuff but if he's just humble and he doesn't mention it one time and like basically like if you're that strong other people are going to talk about you we don't need to hear it from you <laughs> yeah, you know what i mean exactly. if you're the guy that's telling us it's a world record and nobody else is it's probably not a fucking world record or it probably doesn't mean much you know <laughs> what i mean so yeah. that's I, I think it's a great topic now speaking of hanging out in home gyms real quick uh -huh. um I'm not in mine right now, um, <laughs> oh, yeah. but my home gym, if anybody's ever seen any lifting videos of me, you'll see a banner behind it says Temple of Truth. Now, I'm not going to go deep into why I named my home gym the Temple of Truth, maybe another time, but mine is the Temple of Truth. But to combat that, I named my home gym <laughs> Temple of Truth. I got the banner, whatever. <laughs> Tell everybody what your home gym is titled. <laughs> Or at least what your rebuttal to me was and why you chose that. Temple of Truth. 
Church of Lies. Church of Lies. <laughs> Church of Lies. So, so if anybody wonders what Chaz's uh, home gym is named, it's the inside joke Church is it's, of the, lies. it's the Church of Lies. Yeah, so I don't know if he's really lifting that much when he does his flask lifts or if he's lifting an axe. I, I don't know. If it's the Church of Lies, I don't know if I can trust much coming out of it. Listen, but, uh, I'm sponsored by fakeplates.com. So go there, use discount code STRANGER for 0% off. They'll okay. give it to you. Uh, yeah, they're all fake. These York, York plates are all fake, so it's great. It's kind of <laughs> like my inch dumbbell collection. All my bells are fake, too, on YouTube. All your, yeah, they're rubber because they bounce. Yeah, they bounce. When, <laughs> when, you, when, when I drop 170-some pounds from three feet high in the air and it bounces on a rubber stall mat, it means the dumbbell's rubber and it's fake. Yeah. YouTube yeah. taught me that. Good. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I've, I've, I've learned my lesson uh, going down that route. Now, um, in your background, you mentioned, and this is another kind of like comical take on, um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Just filling this stuff out. But uh, 15 years of subpar powerlifting is your background. <laughs> Can you kind yeah. of break down, uh, d define what subpar powerlifting is? Because that's kind of an opinion. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like, like if you go walking to your local Walmart right now, you probably don't have the lowest squat. You're probably not even an average squat. You get what I'm saying? You probably put yeah, stronger yeah. numbers than the average guy. So could you just go in and kind of break down maybe what I get the joke, you know, 15 years <laughs> of subpar powerlifting, but it just shows that you have full body training for a long time as well. So like, you're not yeah. just a grip guy. You've been having, you've had a uh, full body, you know, work uh, strength base that's been going on for a long time. You define it as subpar, but could you, I guess, elaborate <laughs> so, a little bit? So I guess, so right after we got in the grip, I was, I was 16. I said, yeah, I was 16. We got in the grip and grippers and all that stuff. And then we started going to the gym and we were doing, we were, we were idiots. We would bench max bench every day and then do something else like a leg press or a bicep like so like it was it was we didn't know what we were doing uh this is 2005 so if you're like oh why didn't you just look on your instagram because there wasn't one we had myspace and you had to do it from a computer and then you weren't allowed to use the telephone while you're online so they really date to really it would start making so, funny noises or something yeah. like dial up it wouldn't work yeah so so we, we started like you know lifting and we we didn't we didn't want to look pretty we wanted to be strong so we would lift heavy and then I actually, I forgot about this until I just remembered. So we started lifting when I was like 16, whatever. And then when I was 17, there was like a, a strongman contest in my in my area, not too far from me. And I was like, oh, there's, there's a teenage division. You know, it's teens. I'm 17. I'll do the teenage division. We'll see how that goes. So I went down the, this, the only strongman gym in the area at the time. Back then, this is 2006 now. It's the only gym with, with like, you know, uh, Atlas stones, logs, tires. They had a Conan's wheel you could have set up in the parking lot. They had sleds. They had, uh, you know, bumper plates and Olympic platforms. You know, it's Iron Sport Gym down in, you know, Glenold. It's just south of South Philly. And uh, so I trained there a couple times for the out for everything like that. And I did it. I actually did a strongman contest when I was 17. Five teenagers. The guy who won, I took second place. The guy who won was 19. And like a full grown man. And I'm like, yeah. you fucking asshole. <laughs> like, what the fuck, man? But yeah, I mean, I got kind of showing up like it's like a, I, I mean, essentially, that would be like a freshman in college or like you said, just a, essentially an adult at that point, kind of beating yeah. up on high school kids. Yeah, exactly. But uh, so we, that was a fun, that's actually a kind of funny story. So I go to this contest, it's like a 220 log press. I barely get it to my shoulders and I can't press it. First event, I get a zero. I think the guy who won got five, another guy got three, and then three of us got zero. I'm like, why did I, why did I do this? Why am I down here? What, what made me think that I could? Because I, I watched World's Strongest Man growing up. I love, you know, Magnus Samuelson is the is the goat. I don't want to argue with anyone because I'm right. You know, him, Marinus Pujanowski, Drew Savickas, Sven Carlson, Phil Pfister, all those. Like I would watch the, the shit out of it. We had Magnus's DVDs. Obviously, he's the COC four closer, right? He broke uh, he he broke Mega Man's arm arm wrestling. So, first event I zero. I'm like, why did I do this? What am I doing here? This is stupid. Second event was Conan's wheel. It was like 500 pounds. And right before I go, some guys like, hey man, so so what you want to do is don't pick it straight up. Step into it like sideways. So you're yeah, like leaning into the wheel. Leverage. I'm like, 
Yeah. I'm like, all right, I'll give it a shot. So I go and I get two revolutions. And everyone else is getting like a half a revolution one. The guy who took first place got one and a half. And he was like, he came up to me. I was like, man, I thought I was going to have an easy time winning this one. I was like, I guess I'm going to have to actually try. I'm like, yeah, motherfucker. He was cool. Don't get me wrong. He wasn't. Yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. But also, yeah. you can go fuck himself. Yeah. Uh, like, why, so why'd, you, like, why'd you show you just thought you were going to have an easy route? Is that why you yeah. showed up? Like, who, who wants to compete <laughs> like that anyway? You know? so, exactly. Yeah. So, so. I'm like, I'm, now I'm feeling myself. I'm like, yeah, this, this is what's up. This is the best. I'm, I'm a genius. This is why I came here. And then it's like, this whole competition went up and up, down, up, down. The next one was like a 500 pound yoke. I'm dropping it constantly. I barely get, I think I barely finish or I don't even finish, whatever. So I get like, like fourth or third place on that. I'm like, God damn it. And then it's a farmer's walk, like 225 each hand to a power stair. And I'm like, all right, I got a pretty good grip. I mean, you know, I feel like I'm gonna do pretty. I didn't practice this event at all, and I do the event. And my buddy Wayne's there, and he goes, "No one's fucking beating you. That was you couldn't have done that faster without weights in your hand." It's like, yeah, yeah. And this motherfucker beats me by a by like one second. I'm like, wow. Are you kidding me, dude? So we went up the Atlas Stones. Uh, I think I finished three or four of them. I finished four of them faster than he did four, but then he did the fifth one, and uh, I took second place. I want like a sword and shit. That was that was cool. I okay. still, I still you, have a, Vi- a Viking sword. Do you still have it? Yeah, somewhere. Somewhere. Uh, might be in storage somewhere. I don't know. Okay. We'll have to hunt that down sometime. <laughs> but, <laughs> I think my mom has it actually. It might be in like Florida somewhere. <laughs> do you remember by chance? I, I'm, this is a big ask, but what the heaviest stone you lifted that day was? Two seventy five. A 275 stone? Yeah, to okay. about about a two do, 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 how big of a platform? Whatever the fourth platform height would be. You yeah, and we're, and we're still talking teenager though, right? I mean, yeah. just to keep in context, this isn't like 25-year-old yeah. dude just picking up yeah. a 275. I mean, so that's a that's a pretty good I, stone for a teenager. Yeah, I was I was I mean, really happy with it. Yeah. yeah. I, I I went to when I when we we would go to Iron Sport whenever our gym was closed because we went to like a, a chain gym for a while, Bally's Total Fitness, and they'd okay. be closed on like the holidays. So me and Wayne, like on like like Memorial Day or Easter or whatever, and we're working, you know, we don't give a shit. It's like, all right, well, Iron Sport's open point. So we go down there for the holidays just because they would be open. So I remember going there one time and doing Atlas stands, and the, the owner, Steve Pulsanella, comes up. He he competed. He's a Highland Games decorated athlete. He did the World's Strongest Man in, like, 93 as, like, a he was a alternate. He's like, okay. I had no business being there, but I was there, so suck it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, he's like, yeah, man, you're, like, a natural at the stones. I'm like, thanks. He's like, yeah, you got the perfect build for it. You got those long arms and no chest. <laughs> Yeah. But it was, but he was, but he was, I mean, I think he was, I don't know if he was busting my ball, but he was right. Cause Wayne, so Wayne's about five, nine and he's like really short and stocky and he's stronger than me in every lift. And I'm just beating him on the stones and I'm beating him in tire flips. And yeah. it's like, it, it was just weird. Cause it's like this guy who can out bench squat and deadlift me, like I'm beating him at a strength thing. So it was cool yeah. to see that aspect of like strong man where it's like, you know, you're the build matters and technique, I guess, kind of. So well, that kind man. of translates uh, into grip as well, or just in yeah. general, just kind of realizing that strength comes in many different forms. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. You, you know, you from your crushing strength, thick bar pinch within the grip world, if you go outside, like you're saying, bench squat and dead and power lifting doesn't necessarily translate to farmer's carry and strong man. Um, right. That doesn't necessarily carry over to like, we, like Joe's done some climbing. A lot of people that kind of share our sport and are into this arm lifting and grip stuff. Um, they're, they have climbing backgrounds, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So like, that's a different type of strength in itself. Um, so th- I think it's interesting with, uh, power lifting. It's pretty straightforward. You kind of know what you're getting. It's these yeah. three things with yeah. strongman. When you start kind of varying the events up and with grip, when the events are varied, that can shut that shuffle in the deck can really throw things off. So you really, uh, I don't know. You know what I mean? It's just kind of interesting because strength is, uh, there's a lot of different forms of it. And I guess it just really depends. Like you said, a person can have special advantages in one lift, find their knack yeah. for something and it can, uh, it can just shake stuff up. 
where you get yeah. somebody like you said where you're like in your head you're like okay this guy should be able to like stomp me at everything but i'm lifting bigger stones i'm flipping bigger tires yeah. i'm yeah, you know mm -hmm. that functional whatever it may be there's you realize that maybe there's more to the more, more than just doing a static lift or yeah more whatever. than just numbers there's yeah yeah so, there's an application of the strength or applying it in some capacity i guess right um so I just Oh, yeah. Uh, so subpar, 15 years of subpar power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, so we, we, we got caught up on the I strongman stuff. I, so I, after that, I just did, you know, the regular, you know, squat bench that I never, I did one powerlifting meet when I was like, probably in 2012 or 13. I just did a push pull just to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we would just go to the gym, squat bench, deadlift. We ran a bunch of, we would run a bunch of programs like the cube method and Five three one for a couple of years, and then we started. We tried doing some conjugate stuff, but there wasn't enough, you know, chains or anything like that in the gym or anything. But yeah, we, you know, so, so far I got I had okay number. I was never really like super happy with my number. I always had a terrible bench. I did okay deadlift, and then I think when I, you know, I had a decent squat at one point. But now it's like you watch these kids going out there, and they're just like, <laughs> you're like Jesus yeah. Christ, man. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, there's, it, I don't know, it, it can kind of, I don't want to say drive you crazy, but yeah, I don't pay much attention to it because I just understand like the context of it. But yeah, I mean, there's, you get into this like, and I'm not in it or I don't have it, but like the TikTok and all that, like you, you, you start going down this rabbit hole of what young kids doing this or what phenoms are out there. And it's like, yeah, there's some like 15 year old kid that's probably benching 600 pounds. Cool. Like, you know what I'm like? It's just, it's a thing, you know? So it's like, yeah. you stay on the internet long enough, you'll, well, that's, I guess that's two things. If you stay on the internet long enough or you travel and go compete out in person long enough, you'll kind of find out where you stand. Yeah. yeah just, exactly. just, the only, just, just the internet scrolling isn't going to make you any better. Whereas going out and actually competing will improve yourself. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. If you, if you kind of want to find out where you stand and, uh, learn something and actually apply it and gain experience and improve yourself and improve at it. Go find those good people that are going to raise your level in person, as opposed to scrolling through social media and then almost getting depressed because you're not getting PRs every time you lift, or you don't lift yeah. as much as X, Y, Z power lifter at the top. You, you're not supposed to, you know what I mean? Or it's, it's, it's right, you, yeah. you don't have to, that doesn't have to be your training, you know? Um, so but yeah, so just having a well-rounded base, a little bit of powerlifting, kind of strongman base mixed with this early exposure to steel bending and mm -hmm. grippers and stuff. So you're in tune with a lot of that stuff. Um, I just want to bring up uh, for like past achievements and accolades, you wrote down that you got first place in the, I'm going to hopefully I say this right, Harito. Mm -hmm. That's correct. First okay. place in the Harito bending contest for reverse grip. Um, could you explain what you bent and what exactly that was? So uh, I think it's pronounced Jan Heller, mm -hmm. who, who runs Harito, had a contest last year or some time ago where it was bend one of his bolts, either double overhand, double underhand, or reverse in iron mine pads in one minute. And there'll be three different columns. And then whoever has the highest total score will, would win. So it's like if you did first place in this one, second place in this one, first place in this one, I guess your score would be like four, and then that would be how yeah. you determine. So there's individual uh, leaders for each style. So I ended up pretty early on in the contest. I did a, I think I did a, a five and a half inch A2 double overhand, and I was like, oh, that's pretty good. And then I did a reverse grip. I did a seven inch. Uh, Frito A2. A2 is a 5 16 thick by seven inches long stainless steel bolt. Uh, it's actually eight millimeters, which I might be slightly smaller, slightly bigger than 5 16 because it's metric because they're, they're from uh, mm -hmm. Germany. Mm -hmm. So I bent that. Uh, I bent a seven inch one reverse grip and I like smoked it. And I was like, oh, that's, that's pretty good. I feel pretty good about that. So I'll cut an inch off. So I did a six inch one submitted that i was number one on, on the category for it i'm like all right well that's cool i'll be number one for a little bit until david wiegren or or uh tom finglass or or uh you know chuck and canuck uh 
pizza or whatever. I was like, but it'd be cool. I'll be, I'll be first for a little bit. You know, one of these guys certainly will do a 5.5. And then like, as the contest kept going on, like all the double overhands and double underhand bends keep getting like changed of around. There's more and more people going. And then my bend's still there. I'm like, oh, someone, they're just waiting. Cause I know, you know, I'm not a better bender than these guys. I know they're, especially Dave Weger. I know he can do this. Yeah. And the contest ended and I was still in first place. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. You surprised like, yourself. Yeah. I was like, gee, I was like, especially because like Tom, uh, I think he took like two good attempts at beating it. Cause mm -hmm. it was either you beat it on size. So if you bend a smaller piece, you win, or if you beat it on time. So I don't know which he tried. If he tried doing a six inch piece faster, if he tried doing a five and a half inch piece, but he tried he actually tried it twice and couldn't. I was like, hmm. I tried. I was like, all right, cool, man. And then I got like yeah. my little like trophy for it, first place from her. So it felt pretty good to, you know take first place in that the overall winner was dave weger now he just okay. he is in my opinion in that year what was it 2022 he and we talked about this in our bending group chat i think he was the bender of the year because that was that contest proved he was the best overall uh was it non-brace bender i would say because double okay. overhand reverse grip and double underhand so he he got all those, and then he did a bunch of monster uh, brace bends of like huge pieces of steel, and then he's always like a, a four three reckon with with uh, horseshoe bending. And I was like, he, this dude had probably had like the best year, like it's insane. But okay. yeah, I ended up winning it, and I was so it was a six inch piece of uh, five sixteen stainless steel bolt in single iron mine pads bent in less than a minute. I think okay. I did like thirty seconds. So yeah, that was cool. Now <laughs> onto the other one. Um mash monster two certification yeah. um for anybody who doesn't know the grip board is like an old school grip form it's been running for a long time um there is a certification process for their grippers um do you want to kind of break that down being a better gripper guy than myself kind of what the mash monster ladder is and then mm -hmm. we can go into you certifying on that second level yeah so you want to go into the bat, like how it got started too? That's a quick little or you could do that. I mean, yeah, however, however you feel the listeners would understand, uh, I guess, the magnitude or what kind kind of a frame of reference for what that close of a gripper means. Okay. So I don't get any of this wrong. So I think it's 18 years ago on the grip board, they had a whole bunch of people that were three closers. And then there's five only five dudes that are four closers. Right. And then it's like, so you close the three and then like, realistically, the four is probably not going to happen. So then what do you do? You're sitting there in like limbo, like, all right, I close. there's no 3.5 yet. Like there's no other cert, you know, certification. What do you do? So they go to Warren Tedding when he was still alive and they had him custom make a set of grippers, which as of right now goes up to Mash Monster 10, okay. maybe technically goes up to 11. It goes up, to, we'll say it goes up to 10. And these grippers were between a three and just past the four, probably now at this point. And they basically were a way to, so you got a, a 75, I think it was 75 three closers at the time, 18 years ago. So it's a lot. That was yeah. a big percentage of them who were all just equals. And it's like, all right, well, let's not make everyone equal. Let's find out where everyone sits. Cause with a number three certification, you get sent a gripper. Well, back in the day, you could just bring a gripper. But now you get sent a gripper and you have to close it. And it's like, you don't know, grippers vary a lot, gripper to gripper. I have a three that rates 135, and I have another one that rates 154. Like, yeah, you're not, there's a huge, huge difference. It's a giant. It's in grip and hand gripper, it's huge. So they custom made these grippers, the Mash Monster 1 through 10. And 1 and 2 are the same gripper, but the mounting on 1 is lower, which makes it easy because that's how leverage works. And they made it so that you sign up for it. You get sent the gripper, you have to open it on camera, you have X amount of time, I think 15 minutes, and you have three attempts to make a legal close on it. You send it back in, uh, judges vote on it, and if it passes, then you get put on that match monster spot. Once you do one, then you're allowed to do two. Once you do two, you're allowed to go three and et cetera and so forth. Yeah. So you can't just start anywhere you wanna go, even though someone might be like a four closer and be like, well, let me, let me, let me try match monster six. It's like, you got to start at one, man. Yeah. So, 
and they made it so one is accessible to anyone who's already a certified three closer, or if you send a video of yourself, parallel set in a three and closing it. So, and then that has to get judged and approved and that way they know, you know how to film and everything too. And, you know, it's really, I, I think it's probably one of the best, it's nearly perfect uh, grip cert, except for the, like the, the huge gap between two and three, which people know about, but, uh, because number one, the match monster one feels like a nice three. Match monster two feels like a harder three. And then it jumps, you know, from like like 20 RGC. Like it's a lot. Because uh, if you, you look at the list, you see a whole bunch of ones, a whole bunch of twos, and then threes is like, oh, only a couple guys there. And then starts to weed people out. Yeah. So whoever gets three, their name's probably on four because they're super close together. And then there's a smaller, you know, bigger gap between four and five. And then whoever gets close to the five, you can probably close the to six too. So it's like all the same guys mm -hmm. and then just goes on and on and on. So it's, you know, it's a good, I think it's a good certification. It's, you know, way to really measure yourself. Everyone's closing the same exact record. You don't I was going to, I was, yeah. Yeah. I was gonna yeah. Bring that yeah. Up. yeah. So they, the, the Mash Monster one that I closed was the same that 160 guys closed. The Mash Monster two was the same that, you know, 67 guys close or whatever it is. Yeah. So everyone feel, everyone closes the same gripper. It's almost as even as like you can get. And uh, yeah, you can keep going up from there. And now just to, for listeners to know, like how you can kind of be put on the spot is when that camera starts rolling and you're unboxing it and you have to take your attempts, if you fail those <laughs> attempts, you don't get to just like, oh, I'll do another 15 minutes tomorrow, right? Yeah. That attempt is your attempt. And if you yep. fail it in defeat, you mail that gripper back and you just got to get back in the queue some other day because you don't get to just keep trying it. Right. So that's yeah. how it's kind of similar that you, know, you have a window basically where it's like right. they send it, you either close it within those rules or you're shipping that gripper back basically defeated. Exactly. Uh, and, 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 you've have... closed, uh, and you've closed the Mash Monster 2. Right. Yes. Mash Monster 2 right hand, Mash Monster 1 left hand. I almost got the two left handed, but missed it probably by you know, two credit card thicknesses or something like yeah. that. But uh, okay. yeah, I actually messed up on my Mash Monster 1 video. I got it. So they made a new rule. You have to film all three attempts, no matter what, because okay. some people are having too blurry of videos or something like that. Yeah. So I do. And I'm like, I'm nervous because, you know, if you, it can't leave the frame of the camera. And it doesn't count anymore. Like you have to be on. I'm yeah. filming by myself in my garage. I open it up, chalk up, I slam it righty, I go get in position, I slam it lefty, and then I push stop record. Wow. And like, <laughs> I was like, and then I hit it again. I'm like, you stupid mother. Like, I'm just like, God damn it. Can so I, I clip, clip this back together? <laughs> I, was, <laughs> so I was like, I, I completely forgot for a second. I didn't know what to do. And I just, you know, hit record again. I recorded the other two closes, which I, I got on the, the other hands. You know, I got all three closes. Yeah. But then I submitted it back in, and Bill Peace, the guy who runs it, uh, won a grip. He goes, hey, you know you have to do all three closes. You only did one. Why'd you do that? I was like, he's like, I, the judges are asking. I'm like, it was a reflex. Uh, I had a brain fart. Like, I just, I messed up. Like, I mean, I get like, hey, do what you want to do. I, you know, and they let it pass because the, the, the video is clear. Like it's, yeah, I close the grip for both hands. It's not even, you know, hard to the sets clear everything. So they let me pass, but they asked why. I was like, I'm just, I'm dumb. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a smart man. <laughs> but it wasn't like a cocky, like a cocky, like oh, I'll close it once and that's it. Because yeah, just I mean, out of habit. How many times have you? In your training, I mean, filmed gripper closes, and I mean, it's like record, set, close. Stop you're not, I'm, not even, I'm not even thinking it's just that's I mean, the that's yeah it's like breathing you're not thinking about it like, oh, yeah. God. except for in that <laughs> cert it's like hey you know i can't do yeah. that um so that's basically some accomplishments that you're kind of proud of or you know some bigger things that are, are a little more notable that you've kind of you know knocked off the list um future goals that you have written down that you'd like to approach um lifting the inch dumbbell lifting the fat man blob and climbing up to that MM4 that you spoke about. Yeah. So do you have kind of a priority of which one of those you want 
first which one's up next it's maybe you just got to kind of wait and see how training goes before you kind of pick one out or it'll yeah. it'll happen when it happens yeah they're, they're kind of so right now at this moment i'm kind of uh taking a break my finger is like really messed up like it just hurt like it hurts when i like tie my boots in the morning like it's just bad like i should probably do something about it but i'm not gonna because i'm you know stubborn right hand's feeling better i could probably start doing grippers and stuff with that but uh if so since i started doing all, the, all this competing like i really just want to keep competing and doing stuff like that and bump my numbers up but i might just try to i think i'd rather i want to lift the inch dumbbell more than the fat man or the mm4 and if you're wondering why mm4 not mm3 it's because they're the same gripper basically okay like they're they're so close like uh it's not even so once but you, you want, the, but, but if they're both going to be close you want the higher one yeah or the slightly well, harder one yeah once i'm back up in that if i get to that range i'll get mm4 if i get mm3 i'm getting mm4 basically oh i yeah oh but uh if i had to pick one of those it would be lift the inch dumbbell so okay so lift the inch would kind of be the one you want the most now just to kind of backtrack to the grippers real quick um I know you've done the MM2 certification or Mash Monster 2. Mm -hmm. What, I know we talk about training, doesn't matter, certification, but if, we, if we're just talking about a feat, what is, uh, what's probably the best gripper close you've ever done in training or in your life? Or in your opinion, what would be your best gripper close that I guess the highest gripper, the hardest gripper, the one you're the most proud of? I, I closed, I have a Beef Builder Elite, a Tedding, a tedding Elite, sorry. Uh, that's rated 170 that I closed and that's that's got to be I closed that one time I closed uh 165 at nationals two years in a row but that 170 I closed that and I'm, that's probably my my favorite one that I've done so far okay as far as like uh because I've done that that was kind of like parallel maybe even a little closer and then I've gotten 165 with the 20 millimeter block and then 158 with a 38 millimeter block which is inch and a half and then is, is that one... like a ghp block yeah yeah okay it's exactly yeah it's exactly that so 158 with that and then i've gotten 152 with the credit card so i was working on the credit card set but then i, I both my hands were hurt and now my right hand's kind of healed getting like healed now but lefty's still kind of bummed out but okay so we'll see so that's you know yeah, probably that okay. 170 close. So now it's worth mentioning you have the inch is kind of your priority, lifting the inch dumbbell, mm -hmm. lifting the fat man blob, and you have both those items in your home gym, correct? Yep. <laughs> so you're actively training on them and you have access to that because there's a lot of people that have that kind of on their radar, but they're like on the hunt for the inch bell, trying to find one, trying to yeah. find a fat man blob. And <laughs> you don't have that issue. Your issue is just a matter of keeping the hands healthy and knocking out the training right right yeah what uh minus the uh the recent kind of uh setback with hand injuries and stuff um what kind of stuff have you been doing to train for those feats uh a lot of uh the magnet stuff we talk about like i've front loaded the the inch down but i've lifted the inch with seven seven and a half pounds added to the nose on the finger side mm -hmm for like a, a very tilted lift so i've done that and then and then a lot of a lot of lifts with my 143 and then adding adding magnets to the fingers up or to the thumb side yeah so i've gotten that with uh i've almost got it with five pounds added to the thumb side like yeah a couple times but i've like murdered it with fought with two and a half pounds added but then adding that extra two and a half pounds just it's it's so crazy how much of a difference that makes the magnets on it's insane yeah absolutely so uh, if anybody's not familiar what Chaz is talking about while he's training with his heavier inch dumbbell that he can't lift yet like just straight weight because the spin and rotation is too much he's actually making the dumbbell heavier by adding magnets to the finger side because the thumb the, the thumb side is where the dumbbell is going to roll and that's the weakest point He's taking magnets and he's placing them on the finger side, which is going to make the dumbbell heavier, but it is going to counterbalance and offset that rotation and actually end up making the dumbbell easier to lift. 
So that is a way that you can actually lift more weight. It has less rotation, but you're still kind of lifting that same diameter, slightly heavier, kind of adjusting the spin. And then what he's doing with his 143 pound inch dumbbell is he's actually loading the magnets over to the thumb side to increase that torque and make it spin harder to his thumb to kind of bridge that gap. Just a clarification for anybody yeah. who's wondering like, what's this guy talking about magnets on an inch dumbbell? And what, like, I don't get it. That, that is the training principle um, that you'll see a lot of times that uh, guys will use because one of the biggest killers for lifting the inch dumbbell is uh, it's just that spin, being able to either stop that spin with your wrist or your thumb. I'm not yeah. saying your fingers aren't included in the lift. Obviously your whole hand is, but when that thing rolls to the thumb and you know, your wrist and thumb really have to contain that spin or else that dumbbell is just going to break your hand open. So, right. And um, if someone does have access to an inch dumbbell, but doesn't have the magnets, uh, you can get a good sense of it by go to pick it up and take your opposite hand and take your index finger and point into the side of the dome. Just, you're not lifting anything with it. You're just going to stop the rotation and then try to pick it up. So if you can't lift the inch dumbbell, try it like that. Stop the rotation with your opposite hand and pick it, see how much easier it is. And that's what we're doing with these magnets, but you can actually measure the progress you're making on it. Cause you can't measure how much pressure you're putting your finger on there. Cause you know, you're just pushing, Yeah. but you can measure the, you know, the weight added to which side of the dumbbell that makes sense. Cause yeah. like, you know, yeah. And I've yeah. even told people like with training the inch dumbbell or something to like counterbalance that spin, or if they mm -hmm. don't have something heavy enough to increase their spin, I'm like, just take some five pound plates or something and just duct tape that shit to one side. Yeah. Yeah. Like, there you go. You know, whether, whether it's a string, a strap, duct tape the shit, offload it to whatever side you need, whether you need assistance or whether you need more resistance to fight against whatever that case, there's a lot of ways to kind of uh, do it yourself. You know what I mean? If, if you don't have right. the magnets, Oh, the magnets are too expensive. I don't have magnets. I don't have, you know, whatever the training excuse may be, <laughs> you, you can get, pretty creative with home homemade items or like i said you got plates in your gym you got two and a half you got five pound plates duct tape them on the side yeah. one roll of duct tape around it you know <laughs> it, it it'll work you know what i mean it's just a matter of getting that weight on there attaching it somehow to adjust that rotation so um right yeah i definitely look forward to you lifting the inch the fat man blob and climbing up the mash monster ladder I've only done the MM0, which is basically not on the ladder. It's just kind of like the entry point to, I guess, say that you can uh, apply for the one. So I'm I'm nowhere near yeah, Chaz's level. The, yeah, you're in the mix. That's in the uh, mix. You're there. Not, not yet. <laughs> I'm not, not a gripper guy, but I'm, I am working on it a little bit to uh, kind of round things out and get a little more well-rounded. Um, because for, for a while, everybody's like, oh, yeah, like I'm, I'm launching blobs and bells and pinching, <laughs> pinching 45s and whatever, just name the feet. Yeah. But then it's like, hey, you want to see me close a 2.5? And it's like, yeah, dude, everybody can close a 2.5. <laughs> you know, it's like, so I, it, it, it's taken me a minute to kind of yeah. uh, give grippers their proper attention. But I've started to kind of uh, dabble in that a little bit more and train, yeah. a little, train a little more serious. And, and I, I I've closed some threes, maybe they're on the lower end or right at about average. I haven't really like gotten to the point where I'm slamming real hard threes, but it's also you're doing, it, you're doing good. It, just had, it hasn't been the yeah. biggest focus of mine. So it's like, yeah. now that I'm turning the, the scope on it, I think the increases will start to come. Um, but yeah, I look forward to you uh, landing all those lifts. Um, the inch fat man blob MM4. Um, so yeah, if anybody is, uh, tuning in or following, uh, Chaz's training, be on the lookout for him training those things. And when he pulls one of those off, uh, congratulate him because it probably won't be long for at least one of those. It's going to happen at okay. some point. Um, so moving on, just kind of running down the list, um, in, I will say our sport, I'm kind of making this very broad, right? Our sport, because our sport can be defined as a lot of things. It could be. Yeah arm lifting it could be grip sport it could be someone in their basement garage who just bends steel and picks shit up and does grip feats and has no 
idea about sanctioning with either organization, right? So right. this whole world is like, there's non-competitors, there's people that compete in both organizations. And, and I say Arm Lifting USA, and I say Grip Sport International or GSI, because that's the two premier organizations. If you're looking to compete, those are the two premier organizations where you will be able to sign up, you will be able to contest or, you know, go to a contest and test your skills with everybody, right? Mm -hmm. And then, like I said, but that doesn't exclude for me when I think of the grip world or the grip community, there are plenty of us that are out there, like you said, in the garage, just doing this for fun, just ch trying to challenge themselves, just challenging their buddies. And, and maybe they don't even have a dog in that fight of, you know, who to compete for or what to do. But uh, as far as people competing, um, there is like a little bit of a divide sometimes between arm lifting USA and Grip Sport International. Um, you've competed in both. You just did yeah. Maryland Strongest Hands. You were just at Nationals. Within a month apart, you competed in both. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not too different myself in the fact that, I mean, I was at the Arnold competing for Arm Lifting USA at the Arnold Classic. And then a couple months later, I'm up in Pennsylvania for GSI doing Grip Sport Nationals. So, um, we're both familiar with kind of competing on both sides and willing to compete on both sides. Um, so I guess the, the thing is, is that with these being kind of the two premier organizations that kind of represent, uh, like I said, our sport and our sport, I don't define to just those two because people at their house lifting count too. You know what I mean? Like for, yeah. you know what I mean? It's deeper than that. Like just because you're not in a powerlifting meet doesn't mean that there's not people powerlifting in gym somewhere that have never competed like i'm sure there's guys right now that have never done a competition that are bench pressing 600 pounds somewhere and it's like yeah, yeah he's still bench pressing <laughs> does he get to claim records no but you get what i'm back to the earlier talk but you get what i'm right, saying right <laughs> so if we're just talking basically competing um there's a little bit of history with arm lifting and gsi i don't want to get into like uh I guess like maybe rivalry or get into anything negative, but as far as arm lifting versus grip sport, do you have any um, maybe thoughts about that? Or I'm trying to think of how to put this. Um, maybe ways that both sides or lifters on both sides could work together to make things a more positive thing or more welcoming on both sides. I feel like there's probably some people that only lift in arm lifting USA that are maybe scared off by GSI or they don't even know about it. And yeah. like they would be more than welcome to come over to GSI or sanction their competitions or do like uh, a lot of people do like uh, Mike Saffel and Jason Dingy are getting ready to run one up in Ohio where it's dual sanctioned. Right. Um, right. I know. I think uh, Michael Dalton in Virginia dual sanctioned. So, you know what I mean? You can dual sanction if Cause some of these events cross over, you know what I mean? Where we, we can test very similar lifts. It's, they're different organizations, but a lot of people train the same stuff and a lot of the same implements kind of carry over to where people have the opportunity to compete in both. What would be your advice, I guess, for maybe somebody that only does GSI or Grip Sport International or someone that only does Arm Lifting USA? What would your advice be to them? Be open-minded, try the other one, stick to your guns, or you know, do you have any kind of like take on it as someone who competes on both sides? I would say, say definitely, you know, try not to just stay to one organization because I think that there's a lot of really good things that each of them do separately. Okay. And like almost like they have like, uh, like they have gaps. And if you like cover them over top of each other, it would be perfect. Like they, it would, if you know what I'm saying? Like I get you, certain yeah. things in, in uh, like Arm Lifting USA has like better marketing than GSI, right? But then, right. GSI has the better lifts, like lifting anything on a loading pin to a lockout is a joke. Like the, the crossbar is just the, the way to go. I don't understand why. And, why and what he's, even... yeah. And, and what Chaz is referring to is um, most lifts for arm lifting USA, all lifts really. Um, there's no yeah. pull to height. It is all pull to lockout. Lockout is up to a judge. Um, other than like Axel and Saxon bar, when you're dealing with a loading pin lift, in GSI, there's a pull to height where a knock bar will meet a crossbar. Once that height has been hit or determined, the lift is good, blah, 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 it counts. 
So yeah. that's that's what he's referring to with uh, loading pin lifts because loading pin lifts can be a little tricky to call lockout on. Yeah. Um, right. then, some, yeah. I'll just let you go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's hard hard to tell true lockout on a loading pin lift when you're doing like max effort. And then also you could like sumo the lift and lift it like like two inches and then that's a lockout lift. But yeah. then if you if everyone's lifting the six inches on a crossbar, it's like playing field's level. Everyone you gotta lift it six inches. There's no yeah, it's not the same as like when you watch guys bench and they go, Well, my arms are too long. I'm not a good bencher. It's this guy because his arms are short. It's no, we're doing six inches. This is a and it's not every lift is six inches, but just for yeah. instance. There's a lot of you, lifts that are six inches to a six inch yeah. pull height. And 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 I would like to add to the the six inch pull height. Someone might say, Well, what if this guy's six four and this guy's five four? Or, or or blocks, right? <laughs> yeah, then you're allowed to stand on blocks. So you can stand on blocks to adjust that height so that everybody's pulling within the same range of motion. So if you right. were to say, oh, we're, we're pulling to six inches, but there's a height variance. Well, you can make up for that by standing on blocks to get your leverages to, you know, your optimal level or your optimal pulling range. So right. that kind of negates that excuse that, you know, even though it's only a six inch pull, well, this person's tall there. It's easier for them to pull it. This person's short. They, they have to like shrug it to get it to the lockout and right. with, with blocks and a platform or something that that can all be arranged and adjusted. So um, I, I definitely uh, agree with when a lift is on a loading pin and it becomes maximal, very hard to judge. And the one thing yeah. I also wanted to bring up um, just to kind of, uh, I guess, expand on what you said some of these loading pins that typically get contested are tall for, for some reason, people love tall <laughs> loading pins. I know right. they come in different sizes and, and that <laughs> might just be because iron mind came out and theirs was 15 inches. And that was kind of the standard. And then everybody kind of stayed within that realm, but pretty much any contest you go to that has a loading pin, it's a 15 inch pin. When you add that carabiner, it's probably another three inches. When you add whatever handle it's connected to, it's probably another three or four inches. So now we have the pull height up extremely high. Yeah. So what I'm going to get to the point of is you're talking about people spreading their feet so wide that by the time they stand completely up full lockout, they might only get two to three inches of clearance. So they're actually doing less than a six inch lift. Yeah, exactly. And you're saying <laughs> if they were forced to have to cover that range of motion and make that even for a loading pin lift, that would be better. Now, would you prefer the Saxon and Axel, those typical barbell lifts, a uh, fat grips still to lock out, right? I, or I think with those, I think you, I feel like you need two judges. And like, I know it's hard in grip because there's not, you know, there's not a lot of people, some contests, you know, whatever. I feel like you, you need, and I, I think I've seen this on like a, uh, like a Hummer tire deadlift video or whatever. There was a back judge and a front judge. The back judge is looking to see if you're locked out. And yeah. then the front judge is judging, I guess, soft knees or something. So that way, once the front judge gives you the start, back judge will give a thumbs up that the lifter can't see. And then the front judge can see it. And once he sees that, then if he sees what he likes, he tells him down and it's good. Something like, I could, <laughs> some of these lockouts that get approved, it's just, it's awful. It's uh -huh. bad. I've seen some and, and I understand that, you know, there's, there's human error involved yeah. and there, there's always going to be um, anytime we're in that moment. I mean, it's, it's I, an example I would use is it's very similar to like, and I don't want this to go like on too big of a rabbit hole, but <laughs> uh, a good example that I'll use is like trying to judge some lifts. It's very similar to like police camera body footage where like, the cop might have to make a split second decision to save his life in that moment. Yeah. But then everybody in their couch gets to sit there and watch it in slow-mo a hundred times and then say, he was wrong. He was right. <laughs> like, well, when you get to watch it in full on slow-mo, yeah. you know what I'm saying? When you get to replay it nonstop, the judge does not get to do that. So understand now we could have video replay or when somebody submits a video and then someone can rewatch that video and then it still gets approved then it's kind of like okay there's not as much excuse for that but for like an in-person call i can totally understand how some 
Yeah. If he if yeah. he lifts, get past because it's a split second decision that's happening very quick. But if we have to submit video proof of the lift, um, that should almost eradicate any questionable lifts. And it really does bum me out when I see somebody that I know nail a deadlift, textbook form, hold it for a second, confidence, set it back down. And then I see them lower on a list than a guy that has it roll out with a soft lockout that wasn't a complete lift and he got credited for it. So I, I understand uh, the frustration with the lockout lifts. With with all that being said, I still think that if it is like a fat grips, deadlift, a Saxon, um, if if it's a barbell lift, Mm -hmm. I think it still needs to be pulled to lockout. I just think, I just think judges need to judges just need to be on their shit a little more. And they need to hold a more of a consistent standard with it. Now, if it's a loading pin, I kind of agree. If it's a loading pin lift and we got these goofy sumo stances, guys are pulling it two inches, people are bracing shit against their leg, yeah. whatever the case may When it starts going yeah. that route, it's like the judge needs to watch them and know what's up. And it should just be a pull to height because this shoulder, that shoulder, it, like when you're trying to generate maximal tension, how, how do you generate maximal tension here? but then also like get the shoulder back. You're pulling the object into you. It, it can't be, yeah. it really can't be done. It's not physically possible. No. Um, so yeah. So I, like I said, I, I just wanted to kind of dive in a little bit, whether it be on the lockout, pull to height subject, whether it be uh, like you said, maybe one organization does something a little better than the other, but your message to people would be do both. Do, do definitely do both. Yeah. There's cause it's, and, you just get you know, some experience on both sides and kind of uh, maybe judge for yourself then or yeah and that there is a big mixture between there's people that just compete in both anyway so you'll see the same faces in different organizations uh, contests all the time but then you'll meet new people too and you know you get that different experience on different implements and everything like that but you know i definitely do both if there's a contest around if you don't want to compete and there's a contest that's like within an hour of you then you should you really should consider doing it just you know if you ever have the plans to just because that's close and grip that's very close because there's nothing yeah. you could be somewhere where there's just no nothing around and it's like you're shit out of luck but if you get something you live nearby one of these guys who holds these contests and you're like oh, i'm not gonna do that because it's no go do whatever sanction it is and go have fun yes yeah. i i agree with that because when i was first looking to compete a couple of years ago um you know, it it just didn't seem like anything was going on. And it seemed like, man, if I want to do a King Kong and King Kong is a multi-venue competition, but even though it's multi-venue with venues all over the world, different States, everywhere, multiple hosts, you know what I mean? Sometimes upwards of, you know, 20, probably close to 30 venues all over the world. I still was like two years ago looking and I'm like, I'm going to have to drive eight hours if I want to do this. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, And that was like with everybody that hosted, you know, and I'm like, there's so many venues and, no one's around me. And that was one of the things that kind of uh, also got me interested in once I felt I had enough competition experience of kind of like understanding the format, kind of, you know, you go to enough competitions, you kind of see how things run, you get comfortable. And then you learn, you learn about the sport, you kind of, uh, you know what I mean? Take notes as you go. And uh, that's what kind of got me into wanting to host because I was Mm. like, man, if, if I got to drive eight hours, there's probably a handful of guys that, you know, they, they don't want to drive eight hours, but if I hosted it here, they might show up. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I, that's what kind of got me to host my first King Kong venue was just the fact that like travel was so hard. So yeah, if, yeah. if you're looking at Arm Lifting USA's upcoming schedule, or you're looking at Grip Sport International's upcoming schedule, and you see a venue that's maybe an hour away and you're thinking that's too far, <laughs> you might want to take Chaz's advice and jump on it and just do that shit because like I said, it, it could be a lot worse. You could be in a lot different area and yeah. there's a lot of other people that would love to have a competition keep popping up and about an hour away or have access to that because hell, um, it's been referenced. It's an upcoming competition in uh, September that I'm the co-hosting. 9th? Yeah, <laughs> September 9th, um, I'm co-hosting with Ben Helms. We're doing Heavy Hands, which is going to be through GSI. Um, but uh, even though I'm hosting that, I'm still fucking driving more than four hours. So even though I'm the host, I'm still, I'm still driving. So yeah. Um, So trust me, like if you're just competing and you're just showing up to lift and you have something roughly within an hour of you, 
get out and compete, man. Especially if it's something you're looking to do, just get involved, meet the people. When you meet that person that, you know, you just start like branches out. You meet this yeah. guy, he knows so-and-so, then you go to that comp and then next thing you know, and then you, you want one of these blobs or these inch dumbbells. Oh, you, you talk to this guy. Well, he knows somebody. Next thing you know, you, you're like in the network and you can like find these competitions yeah. and you find these opportunities and, and stuff like that. And then you kind of realize that, Hey, it's, it's not as bad. I don't have to drive eight hours. We can, there's, there's other ways to, to compete. So, uh, right. um, d- does that mostly kind of, uh, cover, I guess that subject, as far as that, just kind of wanting people to get out and kind of, uh, experience both sides of, that aspect of grip training um, or that, that yeah. grip competition. Um, and that's kind of just breaking down some of the differences. Cause I think there's still some people um, that have that question and basically say, you know, what's the difference between arm lifting and grip sport. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time like diving into the, Oh, one pulls to lock out one pulls to height. Um, if anybody is aware um Poncho runs uh, Grip Sport Latino, correct? Yeah. Right. So Eric Rusang did an interview on Grip Sport Latino. So if you guys could follow Grip Sport Latino or find that on Instagram or anywhere, um, Eric Rusang, very decorated um, lifter, athlete, and, and I hope to interview him in the future. I, I will be interviewing him in the future at some point. I can almost guarantee it. Um, but Eric did a very good job. I'm referencing this interview with Poncho for Grip Sport Latino because Eric did a very good job of breaking down what the difference was between the two. Where yeah. one pulls to lockout, one contests these kind of things, the other pulls to height, they kind of contest these type of things. This side you won't see this, this side you're not going to see. You know, you know what I mean? There 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 yeah. is a difference in the sport. But with that being said, there still is a lot of similarities. We're still training thick bar. There's yeah. still pinch there's yeah. still wrists involved you know everyone's what I mean? Our, doing it everyone's doing a three inch saxon bar <laughs> it's in every you yeah know. and, and yeah. both sides are contesting so, you know even yeah. the exact same implement on some occasions so um just just something out there for those of you that maybe have competed on one side haven't competed on the other didn't know that there was a divide or there's two different things just uh from two guys that have competed on both sides there's just a little extra info i guess yeah um so with that kind of being covered other than grip for your hobbies you have movie watching so yeah. you're a movie guy <laughs> i watch All a right. ton of movies yeah and i can actually i can watch movies over and over again okay. <laughs> and then i just you know besides because grip is like my active hobby and i guess that's my inactive hobby <laughs> okay so for uh four movies i i don't want to like put you on the spot too much but we, we got to get into some opinions here and Got i know it. it might not be gripply I'm, I'm, I'm gonna answer with just one easy one okay do you have a movie that involves grip and not not, not like a training video where like you watched like some guy teaching you how to set a gripper i'm talking about like just a, a common regular movie that has like a really funny grip scene in it or something that yep. relates to grip yeah, uh, it's actually in one of my top three favorite movies. And you're going to know the scene the second I, I say the movie. Okay. Uh, it's two guys, and they're, I'll tell you the movie afterwards. Two guys, and the, the one guy's drinking a can of beer, and the other's drinking a, a water out of a styrofoam cup. And the guy with the can of beer drinks his beer, and then, like, crushes it. And then the guy with the styrofoam cups drinks his and then crushes it. <laughs> it's uh, in Jaws when they're on the boat. Yeah. But it's one of those older cans that's actually supposed to be really hard to crush. It's uh, yeah. Quint and uh, what's his name do it. So that's like a funny scene that I always liked. No, that's that's a good one. <laughs> um, I, I guess if I could give one, to, I'm coming up with off the top of my head, would be Of Mice and Men. Okay. <laughs> I've never and, seen that. <laughs> okay, Of Mice and Men. So you got Lenny and George. You probably at least are familiar I've with never, the, yeah. the characters or the principle of the book and whatever. Okay, mm-hmm. so... Um, so you have Lenny and George. Well, uh, Lenny's the big dude, whatever, kind of slow, blah, blah, blah. Um, dude goes to punch him and he just catches his hand and just crunches it <laughs> like in a crush grip and breaks his hand. So if I had to pick like grip popping up in a fairly popular movie that people would know, yeah. it would probably be when uh, 
uh, uh, Lenny, Lenny? Yeah, when, when, yeah, when, when, when Lenny crushes the dude's hand, catches it and just crunches yeah. it down and just breaks his <laughs> hand. Um, so that would be my, that would be my suggestion. So we got a couple of crush, seems like crush examples going on in the, in these films. So now, uh, you mentioned Jaws. Do you have any other films that are kind of in your, like, uh, it's on and I'm not turning it off. Like if it comes on, I can't turn it. What, what movie is that? So Jaws, obviously, uh, Django and Chain. I fucking love that movie. Have you yeah. seen that? The, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Django, uh, The Thing, the original 1982, John Carpenter, The Thing. Kurt uh, Russell, right? Kurt Russell, yeah. Yeah. That, move, that movie's awesome. Uh, any Halloween movie, and by Halloween, I mean the Michael Myers, I could watch all those, put those on whatever. Uh, Alien or Aliens, either one of those, not Alien 3 or whatever, but this is... There's one more crap. I now now I'm drawing a blank blank on the spot. But yeah, basically those. Uh, Rocky, I can watch, and then, I guess it's probably maybe because I'm from Philly, but I can watch. <laughs> actually, <laughs> I actually got a funny story about someone who used to live in live in his house <laughs> in okay. Rocky Town. Shoot, uh, shoot, dude, go go for it. Yeah, let's let's see so, what's up. So this guy who I I know of, I don't know him. His he used to live in Rocky's house up here in Northeast Philly. And this is and Sylvester Stallone's like house for the movie. No, his house. Where still Sylvester Stallone used to live. Sylvester Stallone graduated from Lincoln High School. Lincoln okay. High School is in Mayfair. And this guy lived in Mayfair. You know, obviously, you, you know, this is probably like 15, 20 years ago. And the guy's at his house. I think he still lived with his parents at the time. It was his parents' house. And he's like, he came home from like a night of drinking and just like slept all day. And when he woke up, they were like, oh, you missed it. I'm like, what? What happened? Like, Sylvester Stallone stopped by. He was like, what? Like, they didn't know, right? And he was just like, hey, this is my child in the house. I used to live here. Yeah. Came by, hung out for like a half hour, talked. To they never woke him up. Dude missed it. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty, that's pretty funny. No, that, that's definitely a good one. Um, yeah. I've heard of like similar stories like that, maybe with like Bill Murray or somebody. Bill Murray will like go to like house parties and like start doing the dishes and like give like really good advice to like the kids. <laughs> like yeah, oh, just off the wall stuff where you just wouldn't yeah. expect a celebrity and then they're just like there and you almost don't believe it. But if you're like <laughs> one of those people that's like hungover, drunk or passed out, they're like, yeah, he was here. Like, no, that didn't happen. Yeah. But it's like, no, it actually did. Um, so sticking with movies, um, I'm just going to shoot real quick a... Uh, I guess I'll just do some genres and you just tell me uh, best best movies that come oh, to mind. Okay. Right? Uh, well, let's see. <laughs> so let's just say we'll start with comedy. Comedy, uh, Black Dynamite. Have okay, you watched Black, that yet? I still I, haven't. You keep telling me to. I haven't yet. Too. I haven't yet. Black Dynamite okay. might be, I mean, I think Airplane's the funniest movie of all time, is what like everyone says. Black I, Dynamite. I just, watched Airpl I just watched Airplane not too long ago yeah honestly I mean, it was just kind of weird you know what i mean it's movie out way before i was born but you speak god yeah right or like stop I'm calling me god. shirley yeah so <laughs> yeah. i would say i'd probably say black black dynamite might be my favorite comedy of all time it's so it's michael jai white and i mean he's a martial artist like like he's he's god, i think he's a little bit of background in that right yeah no he, he does some martial arts stuff yeah yeah <laughs> he's a funny video with kimbo on uh online where they're like on the movie set i've seen like, it oh, the one with the punches yeah yeah <laughs> that I, one, I, I, I think i know that. what you're talking about um uh so that would be comedy what about western you watch westerns at all or are you like no go on westerns young guns young guns okay i'll give i'll give you a pass on that because i'm pretty picky on westerns man but i'll i'll give you a pass i'll give you a pass i'm not a big that. western guy okay I, like young I, have guns. Like, I have like a handful of them that are like I'll live and die by. Like I'll fight yeah. someone to the death over the argument for him. But uh, what's your one? My favorite western. Go one. Pick one. If if you're gonna make me pick one, <laughs> I have to pick one because I got a couple. But man, um, probably my favorite western would probably Unforgiven with Clint Eastwood and Morgan Freeman. Okay. I Unforgiven is just a, a killer movie. I remember watching it when I was a little kid and just, I, I, I love Unforgiven. I could name several others that I think are 
Okay. Uh, up there. Like I like the Outlaw Josie Wales, which is also a Clint Eastwood movie. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the like really long ass Lonesome Dove movie with like uh, Tommy Lee Jones and Robert Duvall, where it's like six hours. But gross. Well, it's like a two part <laughs> thing, I think. But but that that that's got to be up there for like one of the best westerns, stuff like that. So I mean, those would be in like my western category. So we covered uh, comedy, western. Uh, what do you say, like action thriller? What do you got? Uh, so. We'll do action and we'll do thriller. Action. Okay, yeah, yeah. How specific you want to get? Action would have to be, ooh, what's my favorite action movie? Damn, this is harder than I thought. Is, <laughs> is I guess, this might be all, Terminator 2? No, no, that's not it. Hold up. The answer is Commando. The answer is Commando. Okay. That's, yeah. <laughs> I'll, save, took, I'll save Terminator 2 for something else. <laughs> Maybe then, sci-fi? Does that count as sci-fi? Yeah. Best uh best sequel. <laughs> okay. Uh and then thriller. What the, uh, I just watched the movie the other night. I rewatched it. It's called Identity. Came out in 2003. John Cusack, Ray Liotta, and then a couple other like real like fame, like like B-list celebrities. You're like, you're like, I, that mm-hmm. person, okay, I know these people. You've seen them in movies, but you don't know their name, but you're like, that's yeah, the yeah. It's the one girl from the faculty. It's like this one chick who's seen in a million things. It's this guy who you like, oh, it's like the guy who's always at the rest stop and he's whatever. Uh, <laughs> it's, called, it's called Identity. Yeah. And uh, so that was, it's like these people, there's a storm and they're in a like a little hotel or a motel by the side of the road and they're waiting for the storm to pass. And then a guy shows up and he's got a, uh, a prisoner with him. Like a guy just getting transferred in jails, and then he gets out, and the people start dying. It's like okay, now now yeah. real quick, um, before for the listeners' protection, <laughs> are you going to give any spoilers in case they want to go watch it? That's no spoilers. That's it. Okay, that's okay. I'm not going to. Yeah, I, I was just going to make sure. I, I, I just in case somebody's listening, they're like, "Man, I'm about to check that out tonight," and then you're like, "Ah, I just told you the whole plot." Um, Although I will spoil Oppenheimer, the bomb dies. Oh man, I don't even. I keep seeing like promos for. I don't even know yeah. nothing about that. So yeah, it, I don't know. It affects me not watching it at all. <laughs> don't know anything about it. Um, but hopefully, uh, you spoiled it for some others. If that, uh, yeah, they all they all know the bomb goes. That's the whole movie. If the bomb goes off, <laughs> that happened to me. I think I got spo- I got uh one of the Star Wars movie ro- spoiled to me in a comment section on like Rich Piana's page. <laughs> Oh yeah, he was like a like a like a a thing about eating whatever. He's like, "Hey guys, by the way, Rise of Skywalker, uh, Han Solo gets killed by his son." It's like, what the fuck? Just out of nowhere, no context, <laughs> yeah. just yeah. And it got me there. so. Big. Um, like, what the fuck? Oh man, um, what other uh, what other categories you got? We said we said comedy, western, um, thriller, Sorry, action, horror? sci-fi, horror, um, sci-fi. Look at this horror, sci-fi. Yeah, I think horror would be the thing that's an easy one yeah and then up there. sci-fi could be oh and the, 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 oh oh here it is the fifth element okay bruce willis yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> gary oldman's in that too he's like the best actor he's like probably one of the best actors in the world <laughs> <laughs> he is if, if if i had to go sci-fi can I go with not a movie? Can, can I twist it a little bit? The TV show? Yeah. Okay, I'll, go, I I'll go old school Twilight Zone. Ah, there you old go. school Twilight Zone is pretty hard to beat because I feel yeah. like everything's got some kind of like twist, a lesson to it. It's like deeper thinking. And yeah. some episodes <laughs> some episodes are kind of duds, but for the most part, you can burn through some Twilight Zone and that would be some pretty good sci-fi stuff. Um, right, yeah. Old school, but... Uh, uh, what's another category here? Huh. Any, anything coming to mind? I'll go with, I think one of my, let me think about this, favorite actors. This isn't obviously isn't okay. a category. Would be, I thought about this a lot, uh, Edward Norton. Okay. You ever, talk, I, like, so I, Edward Norton, we're talking about like, Primal Fear, Red Dragon, American History X. Um, like, 
Rounders. Fight Club, Rounders. But see, I, I didn't really watch them too much. I know of them, but you get what I'm saying. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm a little weird. But, uh, but Ed Norton's been in some good movies. Yeah, The Illusionist. A uh, bunch of stuff, yeah. Oh, uh, The 25th Hour. That's a good yeah. Edward Norton movie. Yeah. He's in that, yeah. Um, I feel like I'm missing one that he was in, and I'm I'm like drawing a blank on it, but it wasn't bad. Uh, no. That doesn't matter. Um, so with kind of wrapping up the movie segment, just I just had to grill you on a couple movie things to see, <laughs> see where you're at. I was going to pick out like this movie, that movie, and have you pick between them, but then I'm like, <laughs> uh, it, it might, I don't know. It may, they might not line up too well. But uh, for people out there that are also into movies, do you have any new recommendations? Maybe um, we're, we're naming like a lot of like, I mean, we're naming like Jaws and you're saying Rocky. Yeah. We're, we're, we're talking <laughs> stuff that was out before we were born. Um, yeah, 74, if, Rocky came out in 76. <laughs> I'm talking Twilight Zone. So it's yeah. like, I'm talking, we're, we're, we're talking old <laughs> shit. Do you have any movie recommendations that are up to your standard that are newer movies that people maybe haven't seen? And you could just hit them up with some quick movie recommendations. Like, hey, if you're looking for something to watch tonight, if you haven't seen this and it's something that's kind of newer that maybe meets your criteria since you're mm-hmm. kind of a, a movie snob. I don't think I'm a snob uh, because I don't think I'm a snob because I, I, I have a problem. My problem is I like everything, <laughs> which is bad, which, but it's good because then when I don't like something, it's, it, my friends are like, they're, you're like a dog. You like everyone. But the second you don't like someone, then we take it serious. Like, yeah, I if you. I like someone, it, it doesn't mean they're a good person. I don't like someone, they're fucked up. Yeah, I got you. <laughs> if that makes sense. So basically, you don't really have like a high bar, or high standard for your movies. Yeah. But if something really shitty pops up, you're like, X and it quit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's like, that's kind of how I am with a lot of stuff. Like movies, music, people. Like, I like a lot of stuff. But if I don't like something, fucking hate it. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> There's a reason. Okay. So no, uh, no movie recommendations or I got a um. There's a movie. This is probably not, not a not a super popular movie, but it's a good like horror movie. It's called uh, The Devil's Candy, and it came out. I think it came out like 2015ish or whatever, and it was like real low budget. Okay. It was like a really good like horror movie, and it had a uh, what was his name? The guy from Empire Records. Uh, crap. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be able to help you on that one. The guy, he was he was Mark in Empire Records. If that makes sense. Uh, so that was. Uh, it's called The Devil's Candy. You probably have to pay like three dollars to watch it or find some website or whatever, but Tubi or something. But uh, that was pretty good. There's been a lot of really good movies lately. Like all the, the new Top Gun was good. Like I Tom didn't, Cruise. Didn't see it. I'm not a big movie guy. I I'm like uh, big into like old movies, but if it's like post 2000 yeah. there's a good chance i haven't seen it so he's, he's convinced the world he's like made everyone forget that he's like a evil scientologist guy and he's just like slamming like great movies out like bringing back the box office and stuff and oh, it's like God. pretty like funny to watch because he's just like all the like the the last couple of mission impossibles are just like awesome movies and it's like out of nowhere and he's like he has to like fund his own movies because the film companies won't take out insurance on them they're like you can't do this stunt because if you die the film's over and he's like all right i'll just pay for the movie then he's like i'm gonna yeah. buy a, i'm gonna buy an f-18 learn how to fly and then we're gonna put a gopro pro on my plane and that's how we're gonna get these shots it's like jesus christ dude like yeah hey, whatever man makes a good makes a good movie <laughs> but uh <laughs> yeah that that's been good what else let me go uh yeah that's pretty much it Okay, so no. <laughs> for uh, a pretty pretty good list, pretty good little movie discussion there. Hopefully, somebody <laughs> that, that's watching or listening is kind of like, hey, I like that film. Or, you know, hopefully they relate yeah. to at least one of those films, or at least if they don't agree with what we said, hopefully they're just like, oh, that's not the best one of that. That's terrible. Like, <laughs> it, it, like just hate on it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if there's a, the comment section below, if you have a better list of movies and you think Chaz's list sucked, let him know about it and write out the actual movies he should have said. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> so I, I kind of like wrap up, like, you know, I'm the one kind of like asking a lot of questions or kind of, you know, poking at the guest and whatever. Um, but then I always give them the chance to kind of ask me stuff. And you wrote down that, uh, you know, basically what one of my goals for the show was, or what, what's your goal for the show pretty much. Yeah. Um, so to be fair and just to answer that question, um, pretty much, uh, man, I, it's very similar to like, we've both sat down and went and listened to like the old twig episodes. And when I say twig, I mean, this week in grip, Jed Johnson's old podcast that he did with, uh, a couple other people. I mean, there was different casts that kind of joined him throughout yeah. that, but, um, Jed kind of ran that it was pretty much an audio only and shown on YouTube or it's on YouTube still up all those old episodes are up so if you're looking for something to uh maybe deep dive in on some history go back in and kind of uh listen to some of those episodes it's interesting to listen yeah. to and they're, they're they're fun I mean so uh and and that's one thing I told Jed I said in no way shape or form by me doing a show do I think that I'm like oh well this is like the this week in grip you know what I mean like I'm not trying to be like part two to that or do that. I'm just, I'm kind of just doing my own thing, man. And the reason I'm kind of doing what I'm doing and what I want for the show to be is just a resource for people where, you know, maybe somebody watched this episode and they didn't even know that this was a sport. Maybe somebody that knew it was a sport yeah. didn't know there was two different organizations to compete in and they didn't even know what the differences in those were. Well, now they learned about that. Maybe this is the first time that somebody who's training to lift the inch dumbbell even thought of putting magnets on some shit. Like I just want to kind of bring everybody in the community together, kind of promote as much positivity as I can, um, be educational, be resourceful. And like I said, I want to bring more coverage to the athletes and people that are competing, um, interviewing interesting guests, people that, you know, the community kind of wants to hear from maybe some outside guests every now and then that you might not expect like, Hey, he's not a grip guy. Well, yeah, hold on. We might have, you know, that it's still we'll my on here you know <laughs> yeah. you can you can work on that um, but uh but yeah that, that's kind of my goal for the show is um i just want a place where we can kind of get to know the athletes and the, the the names and all the people we see doing these lifts right let's sit down for an hour or two and talk and then people can kind of know them or that way when they see them in competition they feel like hey man i already listened to you ramble about movies and shit like you know yeah. they, you, you kind of get to know the people more get to hear from them um, not only that, their hard work when they do competitions. If we have a couple guys at the competition sit down and break down the results, I mean, it's cool when you compete and you do that and you see it on a list somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I was seventh place, or I'm on this leaderboard, or I I got a weight class record here. That stuff's cool, but it's always I always liked when uh, you know people would do like a breakdown. So you know maybe we have a competition, and it's kind of like a sports center or any other analyst show where they kind of sit down and, you know, they're going to talk about how many rushing yards this guy has. And, you know, so yeah, it's cool that you got went to the game and saw that guy do the the sport, mm -hmm. but there's no follow-up a lot of times for our sport. Very seldom. Is it like, did you pull a lift? And then like, wait a minute, someone's talking about my Saxon lift. It doesn't happen. <laughs> so yeah. it would be cool if we had a little more coverage for like post competition results, maybe interview guys after competition. So if I'm at a competition and like, there's a, an overall winner, like at a nationals or Arnold or Olympia, wherever. I mean, just big competitions. Maybe I just chat with the winner of it and do like a kind of like a post fight interview, but like a post lift interview, you know what I mean? So yeah, I have a lot of different ideas. I have a lot of different goals. It's not going to strictly be interviews. There's going to be a lot of other stuff mixed in, but short answer to build the sport. And once again, to reiterate by build the sport, I mean, any organization that's contesting this sport, anybody that's not competing, but still training this sport, you know what I mean? There's a lot of people that do feats of strength at their house and they're chasing, you know, certain plate pinch or they're chasing that inch dumbbell like you are, and they don't have any tie to any affiliation. I include them in this show. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm including yeah. that in build our sport. It's the guys that are bending steel, but it's not in the competition. It's the, the people that are pulling gym gym lifts and just doing doing what they're doing and challenging themselves. So I, I group that in. I don't group it to just organizations being our sport, if that makes sense. Because yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's there's a lot more to it. Um, but I'm cool on both sides and want to see it, just basically everybody do well. And uh, yeah, my 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 reason for the show was it's uh, 
something I kind of wished was out there. And you kind of got little glimpses of it in the past from other shows and other things. But I always felt like I wanted a little more. And then over yeah. time, it's like, whether I'm talking to you or I'm talking to other people, you, a little bit of peer pressure, people might just say, you should do it. Or, you know, you, you kind of get pushed a little bit like, <laughs> and then I'm like, yeah. man, if somebody doesn't make a podcast or some kind of show where they cover this or this, or man, this would be a cool idea. No one's ever going to do it. I guess I'll do it. You, so that's kind of where this came. I wasn't like the first person that I would suggest for this. There's a lot of other people I probably would have named before me. Like, I wish he would make a show and I could give you like a list of like <laughs> probably 10 names that I wish did it. But yeah. when you sit around for a couple of years and nobody does it, it doesn't seem to happen. It's kind of like, guess I'll do it myself. And mm. like I said, if it sucks and it's not good, go make your own show. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's pretty much my take, but man, it's, it's really just to, inform people educate people be a resource bring us all together uh build the sport up whether that be competitive non-competitive feet based i don't care just to inform people raise everyone's level bring people together bring people up um nice, nice. So yeah. that's uh that's pretty much it uh, do you got anything that you think uh we skipped over anything you'd like to touch on maybe close with um uh so what uh Heavy hands. Let's round back to that. How is okay. that going? And uh, yeah, what's that like? That's that seems like it's it's turning out pretty good. Uh, nice, yeah. uh, nice base of people going. I think I'm I'm still going even if my hands messed up. I've decided I'll just like okay. throw it out there and, and get do something. You know what okay. I mean? There's two hopefully, uh, <laughs> uh, hopefully Jed will do the same. I, I don't know the extent of uh, Jed's hand injury. Yeah, but Jed Jed's a big name. Jed's one of the people that would be right there at the top of that competition. Yeah. You know, what I mean, if we're if we're talking top guys, you know, I'm not going to say that Jed's like instantly the favored to win, but it, it's going to be it's going to be a really good contest. That got, like that like one through three is probably going to be pretty tight, like nationals. You know what I mean? Or that one and two. Yeah. I I, th I think with these events, it can uh, it can shape up and be anybody's game. Um, but I I hope that Jed. I don't know the extent of his hand injury. He's mentioned it a little bit. He posted a PR that he just hit on deadlift, but he was talking about using straps because of his hand. So I know that it's bothering him to some extent. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't want to place like any extra pressure. I, I just hope that he shows up. Um, and if it's an injury that he doesn't feel comfortable competing with, well, okay, then there's going to be more grip competitions and no big deal. You know what I mean? The guy's yeah. been competing yeah. for 20 years and at the top of the mountain. So um, if he's injured, he's injured, but that's just me being selfish. I hope he still shows up regardless. <laughs> um, so I, I hope Jed shows up, but man, um, I'm really excited. Um, there's, uh, there's, a, there's some signups I didn't anticipate because yeah. what me and Ben Helms originally thought was like arm lifting USA is like a big hub right there in Virginia. So we were kind of thinking that like, man, there's a lot of like grip fanatics right around there. Ben knows a lot of strongman people. Ben has a big background. You know, I'm in North Carolina a little bit off, but, but we, we have kind of connections, you know what I mean? So I was like, man, we could probably pull a good, like, regional event together. All of our fucking signups are out of state. <laughs> so, really? like, wow. Yeah, so, I mean, I mean we, we got, like, Will Reed from California. You got, like, I'm not going to say yeah, everybody's out. I'm not saying everybody's out of state. Yeah. You're from Philly. Jed's from Wyalusing, Pennsylvania. Um Eric uh, Rusain and Zach Ebel, or I'm hoping I'm saying Ebel right. I'm hoping that's how that name is pronounced. I apologize if I messed it up. But Eric Rusain, Zach Ebel, they're both coming from fucking yeah. Canada. Um, you so, got uh, W's coming from uh, Colorado. Yeah, Jay, right? Jalen Worley, uh, W yeah. on uh, online. His name's W. Grimm. Yeah. He's coming from fucking Colorado. So it's like we have like a group of like 20 signups, which is more than I anticipated. But what shocked me the most about having the, the signups was just where everybody was from. And don't get me wrong. There's a few local people here and there that are, that are doing it, but I just expected a little more support from uh, some of the people in that circle. And I know there's other competitions that are stacked kind of close and maybe they just had to pick between one or two, or, you know what I mean? They can't do them all. Mm -hmm. So, so I'm not faulting anybody. It's just, I expected that to almost be more of a, a regional kind of East coast, Virginia, North Carolina, maybe you guys coming down for Pennsylvania kind of thing. Right. I didn't anticipate um, Colorado, California, Canada. I, I didn't participate. I didn't anticipate that kind of uh, 
participation coming from those people. So in that regard, I'm like pleasantly surprised and I just hope that everybody can make it and I hope that it works out. And uh, yeah, I, I, like I said, me and Ben just want to make a big annual competition where we can get new lifters involved in the sport, the best people and the best people that have ever lifted to show up. And, and, and we reached out, I understand travels hard for people, but yeah. if, if there's somebody that has, has a name and grip, me or Ben pretty much DM'd them, texted them, emailed them, tried to reach out in some form. I'm not going to say we didn't miss a few, but as far as U.S. lifters, we reached out to a lot of people and uh, we got a good response back and whether they could or couldn't make it, everybody was real respectful and cool, but uh, we definitely just made a big effort to try to get the best, uh, the best names there, but that doesn't exclude, you know, being open to new people because there's a lot of probably first time people that are going to be competing as well. The yeah. 90, the 93 kilo class has like seven or eight guys in it. And I'm pretty sure that uh, I'm pretty sure that two or three of those might be guys that Ben knows. And I don't think they've competed before. So those okay. will be, those will be somebody that, you know, Ben has kind of taken it upon himself to not only host this thing, make all these arrangements and do other stuff, but he's, he's bringing some buddies along. He's getting some other people involved. So it's not just about, you know, is, jed eric or ben gonna win first place and take the belt or whoever else is a juggernaut that shows up yeah. there, there's some other dudes flying under the radar that could totally like shake it <laughs> up and I'll, I'll give you one other name are you familiar with tim einstein sounds familiar yeah yeah tim einstein is in virginia not too far from ben and uh he's got big kind of long fingers and he's he's a deceivingly strong guy man um i've lifted with tim at some super series events wait what's his is he ironside yeah ironstein or oh, something yeah, like yeah. that yeah yeah, ironstein, yeah, but, yeah, right, yeah. but his yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> his uh his thick bar is very good yeah and when you put a two inch handle in his hands and that two and three eighths axle in his hand he's right there with anybody <laughs> so um, Tim, I, you know, I'm not saying Tim Einstein's going to take the event. I'm just saying that some of your household names might get a run for their money and they might get beat. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I put, Tim, I put Tim Einstein in that mix because he's, he's, gonna, far, he's tough. He's going to so, keep some guys honest. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it, you're not just going to like, like the dude yeah. that you said at the, uh, at the strongman event, man, I thought I was just going to kind of come down here and win every event. Maybe yeah. not. Maybe not. There's some people that, you know, and, uh, another one I'll bring up, um, Maybe not an event win, but uh, I believe uh, John Fulber, if I'm yeah. pronouncing that name right. Yeah. John John is one of those guys in that stack 93 class. And Yo, John he's... just tied Tanner Merkel's 242, um, 242 pound Saxon pull at a 90 kilo body weight. So um, Tanner Merkel had the Arm Lifting USA record for 90 kilo class at 242. And yeah. John tied it. So now those two share that 242 pound mark at the 90 kilo class. So if John shows up and pulls a 242 Saxon, I mean, that's gonna, he, that's gonna shake stuff good. up. <laughs> he, he ran, so he ran Maryland's strongest hands. He ran a great contest. Yeah. He was, uh, he's, you know, he's like dry humor, funny, like mm -hmm. really good. Cause we, we, we walk in, and uh, it's like me and Jed, and like everyone knows who Jed Johnson is, right? Like it's grip. And Jed goes up to him and says, Hey, how you doing? And the guy goes, Oh, who are you? <laughs> but he's like, he's not laughing. He's like, he's like straight oh, face. Yeah. yeah. And like uh, we go outside. Jed was like, Does he not know who I am? And the guy okay, he's like, Yeah, I was just joking with you. I know who you are. And then, like, you know, at the end of the video, calm like, down, get over here, yeah, <laughs> calm down, weigh in, Jed. It was, uh, it was, it was real. Fun. He kept doing once, once I seen him do that and realized it was a joke. The rest of the competition, I kept seeing him like drop these, like, you dry humor, sense bomb. Of humor. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. okay, I like this guy. <laughs> but, but I'm just saying, like, right there for a Saxon lift, yeah. I mean, when, when a guy, and just because he pulled 242 once doesn't mean he's gonna do it every time, but he might pull higher. So yeah. maybe he shows up with an improved Saxon and he pulls 250. Now you're starting to talk about, you know, right. you're right, you're right there in the top mix with anybody that's pulled on a three inch Saxon, two forties, two fifties. I mean, that's rare territory. So, um, and, and at a light body weight and Eric's at nine, Eric's going to be competing at 93. 
Eric's probably not going to pull a little sacks. You know what I mean? So like some of these events are just going to be very interesting to see how they play out with the he uh, heavy hands because there's some dark horses in each event that kind of hide out. Like, yeah, you might not know Tim Einstein, but he might fuck you up on Axel. <laughs> like, you might not know who John Fulber is yet, but he's, he, he will. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Go, go, yeah. go run a Saxon, you know, run the Saxon lift and you might find out. You know what I mean? Just like they did at the, uh, the Arnold Open. So, yeah. I mean, he outlifted everybody in the 90 kilo class, including myself that I had, a, I had a shit day that day. Not that that matters, but I, I had a terrible uh, Saxon day, but for us top three podium finishers um, at the Arnold John's 242 that tied Tanner's record was above all, all of everything we pulled on Saxon. So, yeah, yeah I mean, that, 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 that in that event, that, that guy's in the mix, that's a force to be reckoned with. So I, I like the fact that there's, that variety of events and i kind of like seeing those names pop up yeah keeps it keeps things interesting man so how's it going um overall uh i'm, I'm happy with the signups um i thought there'd be a little more local participation but considering the fact of out-of-state participation might make up for it kind of trades off i don't care you know yeah um, you might get some of those local guys last minute really too and, and they might they show up in the door yeah, because yeah. this is we're we're just speaking on the online signups. So yeah, someone could just roll up with twenty bucks and and be ready to lift that day, and that's fine right. as well. So yeah, that, that that's pretty much my thoughts on heavy hands. Looking forward to it. Like I said, do you think that because heavy hands is the first time that GSI is going to be tracking two new lifts, right? So the one I hand, say, hand, I wouldn't say it's the first time because they've like added like the rogue grandfather of the v-bar the two inch like grandfather clock they've uh, i mean there's two new lifts in this four gsi in this contest so the two the one yeah. hand two inch nightmare yeah one hand nightmare and then the um the two and three eight uh axle axle you think yeah. the two and three eight axles like bringing people out but you think that's like people are seeing that and going yep i, I think that there's some people that like it and i and i think i might have i might have touched with this when i spoke with joe on here mm -hmm. but uh there's a lot of people, you know, you get these, I mean, just big juggernaut dudes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Strong the strong man. Man. And yeah. I mean, they're, even if it's in straps or whatever the case may be, I mean, they're just big, giant people, giant hands. And, you know, they're pulling seven, 800 pound, you know, strap deadlifts, whatever. And then they get this two inch axle in their hand and their body is just so strong and the grip is not much of a factor because the weights they've been handling are higher. And a lot of grip people will kind of complain that, the axle lift is more about body strength and that yeah. kind of turns some grip people off um, because it's a two-handed lift. It, it is probably aside from like a napalm nightmare, mm -hmm. your, your axle lift is probably going to be the biggest number of the day. You right. know what I mean? So it's going to yeah. be, it's going to have the most body involvement short of a napalm nightmare, which is the rolling handles on a loading pin, but basically, you know, still thick bar. Um, so I think that the grip people that want it to be more about hands or more about true grip strength and not so much just, okay, it's a giant and he has a strong body, you <laughs> yeah. know, like if you want to do that, do strong man. If you want to do that, go power lift. If you want to do grip, let's kind of steer it slightly more towards grip. So that was one of the reasons that me and Ben kind of discussed that was it had a kind of a cool history. We wanted to bring that bar back and, uh, we felt like it kind of tested a little more grip strength than just full body yeah. strength. Um, absolutely. So absolutely. Yeah. That was the reasoning for it. Um, but yeah. And then the two inch handle was also because we didn't want to go like two and three eighths on the axle and then be like, Oh, 2.5 crusher. And then like almost, <laughs> you know, almost double up on the same diameter. So if we're going to go yeah. thick on the axle, we wanted to kind of make that handle a little bit smaller. And that could have been maybe a, a two inch crusher or, you know, something else. There's other things, but I don't think we had a two inch crusher at the time. Um, so we kind of went with the one hand nightmare because it's been used for uh, other diameters. It's kind of in the circuit already with the napalm system and stuff. So yeah, that was our reasoning for kind of choosing a thinner handle um, because we wanted that big axle in. And then we kind of based the secondary thinner handle off of that axle choice. So yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, is that pretty much covered on your end, you think? Yeah, yeah. Good to go on that. Mm -hmm. um, then uh, 
any last words for the the grip community being the uh, being the being the fixture that you are <laughs> fixture jesus uh no, i got nothing get out there and compete uh you know and you guys talked about this a lot on the you with joe and yourself uh it's one of the very rare things rare sports or hobbies where you can message the best guy in the world at something and get an answer like yeah. i could ask hey i'm asking you know i'll message lebron james and ask him how to like work on my free throws and he's not going to answer me but if i ask jed johnson about a, a blob or or adam glass about an inch dumbbell they're gonna be like hey what's up man how you doing oh yeah dude this is what i did you know try this and they're gonna be helpful yeah. so it's like well, i think i could answer i could i think i could actually speak for lebron <laughs> do you, you want me to speak for lebron james since you're since you're from ohio <laughs> no i'm no. not at all i not okay. at all. i'm not even an nba fan <laughs> i just see videos and other stuff so it, lebron james answer would probably be pretend like you got hit and fall down <laughs> right is that the answer yeah that's it you got oh, dudes is yeah. like six eight i don't know how much you weigh whatever and yeah you're gonna be like pulling flopping. soccer soccer flopping. moves where you're just flopping and like doing the worst acting job of all it's like dude yeah. I, I can't respect you're, it i don't i don't give a shit how good you are at your sport i can't respect fake shit so a, sorry to go off on that tangent but you're a yeah. peak human stop acting like that to hurt you like, yeah, and then you and then you go back in the nba to like the 90s and like you know people are literally like ron artest and like death rotter fist fighting over a rebound and there's no one's getting ejected from the game and they're just going back to play right after. or like larry bird or somebody just like <laughs> yeah. cracks their eye socket and then comes back out and just yeah. drops 40 points or some shit you know what i'm saying like just just yeah. be a man yeah be, be a man I'm, so i got you off topic but yeah you can that's, message that's fine yeah but you can but yeah you can you're not going to get a response from lebron james yeah. but you might get a response from jed or somebody else that's higher up or whoever Anyone, I mean, how, yeah i mean I, I anyone i've ever messaged that i felt like is above me in the sport or that was a pioneer that kind of paved the way um every single person has reached out to me and given me some type of advice so um i haven't had a bad interaction with anybody so yeah but uh mm -hmm. yeah man um if that's uh if that's pretty much it dude thanks for uh thanks for stopping by and doing the show and just discussing all these topics and rambling on a little bit with me um, <laughs> and look forward to competing with you sometime soon. And five weeks. other than that, when, when is it? Five weeks. Five weeks. Okay. Yeah. About five weeks. We'll <laughs> see each other. Yeah. See you on the platform. Um, yeah. But uh, so Thanks. yeah, man, uh, see you then. And then, like I said, until then, hopefully the hand heals up. Hopefully you yeah. can kind of dial things in and, you know, get healthy enough to where you're, you can on comp day, you can pull numbers that you're happy with considering the situations. Um, right. But thanks for having me, that, man. It's uh, fun. Okay. It's yeah. And like yeah. I said, we might have you on for a breakdown or something in the future if we do other oh. competition breakdowns. But uh, for everybody listening, um, thanks for tuning in again. And uh, be sure to check out uh, Chaz, all of his lifts. And it's at Stranger Grip. Yeah. Yeah. I believe Stranger underscore grip. Yeah. So if, yeah. if you look up Stranger Grip or Chaz Strange and, you know, Instagram, whatever. Um, You'll probably see him and uh, see some of the feats, see some of the things he's doing and has been doing it for a long time. So uh, definitely worth checking out. And uh, once again, just like to thank all the listeners. Thank everybody for all the support. And hopefully we can kind of keep these videos coming out weekly. It might not always be an interview, but I would like some form of video to stay in the mix, stay in the shuffle, kind of keep things fresh. I don't want people kind of, you know, dropping off for a month or not doing anything. So yeah. I plan on being pretty active. So uh knocking out some interviews once competitions start happening then you might start seeing some of those competition recaps and comp results but i can't cover competitions if they haven't happened yet so until then we can just talk about little predictions like we did a second yeah. ago um, there we go. so you might get a couple prediction videos or something but we'll get into the competitions a lot more as they start occurring and uh yeah just want to thank everybody in grip for their support and we'll basically sign off with that so yep, yep. See you later. i'll see you man Later.